Okay, okay, we are live at 7.15 by my clock. So uh, we are now live. We're talking about the case of Maya Kowalski versus Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital in uh, Sarasota, Florida. So who am I and why are we here? My name is Rob. Welcome to the channel of Law and Lumber. So I'm a lawyer practicing in Virginia, and we break down cases that are going on that are relevant to, well, discussion of everyday everyday situations and things that are, well, that I feel like I can add something to. Uh, today, we're covering the case of Maya Kowalski. Well, the Kowalski family, the estate of Beata Kowalski, Maya Kowalski, Jack Kowalski, and the brother, um, Kyle Kowalski, against Johns Hopkins All, All Children's Hospitals. Now, this is a case that um, stems from facts that were discussed during the Netflix documentary, Take Care of Maya. Uh, for those of you guys who are unaware of this case and the facts surrounding the case, Maya Kowalski began treatment at Johns Hopkins All, All Children's Hospital. We're just going to say Hopkins from now on um, for, uh, well, CRPS, uh, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. Also, you'll, refer, you'll, hear, you'll hear it referred to as chronic regional pain syndrome, um, but complex regional pain syndrome, CRPS. Maya Kowalski was treated there in 2015. Subsequently, the hospital and a person on staff at the hospital uh, alerted to possibility of, well, child abuse, and Maya was removed from her parents' care. That resulted in ongoing legal battle in the state of Florida in the dependency uh, dependency proceedings in the Unified Family Court that resulted from Maya being removed from her parents. Uh, as a result of losing the appeal for one of those removal proceedings after quite some time of going through this, unfortunately, Beata Kowalski, Maya's mother, took her life. And several years later, again, we have treatment that began in 2015. Uh, we're talking about a case of the Kowalskis suing the hospital. So the recovery that they're seeking is, I think, $200 million in damages from the hospital for the loss of Beata, for injury to Maya, and for injury to the family. That's kind of a case synopsis, and we are now in day three of this trial. Opening statements began on the 21st. Um, the uh, Kowalski family is represented by three abled attorneys, and the hospital is represented by a few more. Uh, without going too much into the details, why don't we just get into into some of the testimony that we we saw today in the case. Um, and then I'll give you guys a synopsis of where I th see things and how they are and how they're transpiring. And well, yeah, we'll just kind of go into it. I was more focused on trying to get this thing started on time. Didn't really have a whole monologue beginning. Well, set up for the beginning, but we've got some evidence to discuss. For those of you who are wondering about the other days of trial, and the recaps of the other days of trial, there really wasn't a lot to recap. The opening statements began on Thursday of last week, September 21st. Uh, plaintiff's opening statement, they were both capped at 90 minutes. Plaintiff's opening statement, I thought, was rather lacking. They didn't really have a whole lot of emotion. They seemed disjointed. The hospital's opening statement, however, conversely, um, was remarkably organized. Well, the hospital has the funds. This is one where you see a lot of money that was spent towards the attorneys for the hospital. And the plaintiffs in day one put on a lot of witnesses that were emotional, but I don't know, get to the facts that we need to decide. What we need to decide in this case is whether the hospital breached the duty of care and that breach of duty of care resulted in injury to Maya. And that as a foreseeable result of that breach of duty of care, the injury to Beata Kowalski was foreseeable. That's the burden of proof in this particular case. Now, the other part about this case that becomes exceedingly complicated is the fact that you have Department of Children and Families involved. And we'll get into that. We'll get into that a little bit more as we get into some of the evidentiary objections from today, because Department of Children and Families, the hospital is using them as a shield. And the plaintiffs have to overcome a very significant shield because DCF uh, is immune for their conduct. They are sovereign immune. So DCF is not being sued here. This is not a lawsuit against DCF. So we will see. I will say that the plaintiff's case started to gain a lot of traction in the afternoon session of today's hearing. So um, without further ado, why don't I just roll a bit of an intro and then we can kind of get into where things took off from today. And yes, 
really good point. I'm actually going to put a banner up. We're going to put a banner up. Um, trigger warning. Uh, trigger warning for all those involved. The subject matter being discussed is sensitive and involves uh, child neglect. Well, I don't know if I want to write that word. Involves um, sensitive family and mental health issues. For those of you guys who are aware, let me see, there we go, um, of the facts surrounding this case, I don't want people jumping into the live stream being surprised, being surprised uh, that the subject matter we're discussing involves some pretty, uh, pretty nasty stuff. So, and Mary Jane, that's the subject that we're trying to discern. So it's sensitive contact, sensitive family and mental health issues. That's what we're discussing. Sensitive family and mental health issues, sensitive content. That's it. Sensitive content. So this one's tough. Uh, there's going to be opinions. I would like for everyone in the chat to please be respectful of the opinions of one another. Um, we're not going into too, too much on the trigger warning side today because uh, today was a lot of um, information regarding treatment. But we had every day. Well, let me. Rob, roll the intro. Roll the intro, Rob. Everyone has opinions. You're allowed to have. You're allowed to have opinions. You're allowed to have opinions. Um, just voice them respectfully, please. Please voice them respectfully. Like I said, you guys know I'm a family lawyer. I practice in the in the domestic relations litigation involving custody, visitation, allegations of inter inter partner abuse, child abuse. All of these things are things that I practice on a daily basis. I'm trying to approach this with the requisite level of sensitivity, having kind of followed this case and seeing uh, the evidence as it plays out and knowing the background allegations. For those of you who are going to ask, no, I did not watch the documentary by Netflix. I am not intending to. I will not watch it because I have an opinion of what these documentaries end up being. And I've read enough to know that that documentary is intended to sway me one way or the other. Um, and it's not really going to play out the same in trial. The benefit that I give to you folks that are watching, those who have seen the documentary, is I can explain things that are happening in trial that you might not have been otherwise able to explain just given the documentary. And I can't do that if I've seen the documentary. So uh, let's go on. Let's go ahead and do a little bit of an intro and we'll get to today's evidence. All right. So how we began the day? Well, every single day, this judge, whom I very much, I'm, I'm tending to like, I'm liking him more and more. Um, he has begun with a 30-minute session beginning, beginning at, I think, uh, 8.30 a.m. And he's basically been saying, if we're going to do the evidentiary stuff, we're going to do this up front. Y'all are going to have your little back and forth fights outside the press of the jury, and we're not going to waste the jury's time. So you have 30 minutes before each trial day to bring to me the issues that you think are relevant for today's proceeding. This has been the only parts of this trial that have offered comic relief, uh, seeing the lawyers go back and forth. Well, today I was caught off guard. Um, today I was caught off guard because today they had a foundational issue which required them to put Maya up on the stand early. Not in front of the jury. Just put them up on, put them up, uh, put her up to to verify that a document is what is being proclaimed. So, without further ado, you guys, let's go right into the testimony and see what we've got. Um, let me know if you can't hear. I will try to turn the volume up to the extent that I can. It's not that quiet. It's not too bad. But let's let's uh, let's go ahead and get into it. So. Ultimately, I have the the ability to preclude the jury and then turn off the the uh, monitors in the gallery as well. Sorry, for note, we're talking about a letter. You saw the letter at the very beginning. That's a letter they want introduced. They want the letter from Maya to her family introduced. They wanted to be able to show the jury the letter. So, well, so you can still publish it, or actually, we have the physical paper. We can show it to the witness without the jury seeing it. 
I have the doctor here. I could we could probably do it out of the province of the jury if you'd like to save that. It's up to you, Judge, however you want to do it. It's your case. I'll defer to however you want to do it. But I mean, if to the extent it's something that um, Maya Kowalski state of mind or anything like that, I think you're going to need foundation from her to get it in. So because uh, right now it's it's hearsay I without an exception. All right. Um, you know, probably what I'll do then is. Um, I can put my on the stand right now out of the promise of the jury to identify this and her reasoning for forwarding it uh, to her family and then the family. Obviously, we don't have Viata, but I think that is the purpose of uh, 804 uh, paren. Sorry. Uh, 804 to uh, statement offered, uh, excuse me, declare unavailable. So I can put it in through Maya's foundation and then have the doctor come in and complete that. Whatever you want to do, but I mean, this is a statement by Maya Kowalski, so I'm not sure why Beata Kowalski's unavailability has anything to do with it. Well, she was, I believe, at this time. All right, good. We're going to go through, and yeah, I will be speeding this up a bit. We're going to go through a question that I saw at the beginning that I did want to catch up on. Um, one was, how is this hearsay if it's her statement? It's hearsay because you can't just bring in a statement that's written by somebody else to make it seem more credible that it's on paper and not her saying it. The subject of the written, the writing, Maya can testify to later. But what he is trying to do is introduce an out-of-court statement by Maya for the truth of that statement, for the truth of what's in the words. So he has to find an exception to get that in. Before you show the jury something that Maya said that she's going to testify to later, you have to find an exception to that hearsay rule that allows you to show it to the jury, jury immediately. So that's why they're going over foundational issues. It's kind of interesting that the attorney looks back and says, well, I don't know what you want to do, judge. And the judge looks back and goes, oh. It's it, counsel. It's 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 your case. And I did. Th there are going to be comments about this judge's hair. I know you guys are going to have comments. I love this judge. The only comment I'm going to pull up is this one. We'll call magic. We're going to stick with this one. He's the unicorn judge. He just is. So I've liked his ruling so far. He's been pretty even handed. I'm not going to comment on his hair. I like the fact that he's been handling this case the way he has. He's given the plaintiffs latitude, but he's also been very careful to hold that to some uh, some confines within what the court has asked to decide here. Okay, so here we go. I'm in Johns Hopkins Hospital, and so was unable to be. Uh, obviously, she couldn't get something directly to her doctor. She mailed it to her mother who then provided it to the doctor as i understand it whatever you'd like to do okay it's your case counsel it's that our agreement or that we have to deal with before the jury comes in uh, not on behalf of the well let me see here i, I see a whole bunch about i, I guess to shauna duncan a lot of them were admitted, but there's still others. I'm assuming she's testifying today. She is. Yeah, After lunch. Reacting to the, um, we'll speed it up. We're going to go to 1.5. It's not bad. This this lawyer's kind of slow. Documents filled out by other people, um, not her reports, as we've indicated. If 1.5 is too much, you just got to let me know. 2504, 2508, 2509. And the uh, basis on those is? Well, they're hearsay. It's proper character evidence if you look at the contents of them um so the proper opinions but they're, they're essentially hearsay uh, we're not putting those in for this this morning for the witness uh we'd like to do that maybe at lunch or just before this afternoon the document we would like for our first here we go one moment you're on the lines come on assignments that are due that are uh, a number of nope yes. nope what are we doing about those uh exhibits this is going to kill me Explanation of why this is going a little bit slower than I want it to be. 
law and crimes feed crapped out and they took it down the whole thing and they re-uploaded it as the afternoon session so all of my timestamps are gone every timestamp is gone so we're winging it today it's good practice state your name for the record Maya Kowalski and where do you live Venice Florida and are you uh, one there, of the so you guys can yes and was there a period of time between October 7th, 2016 and January 14th, 2017, when you were kept at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? Yes. During the course of that, did you, from time to time, write letters to your mother, your father, or your uh, brother? Yes. Let me show you, if I may approach you, Your Honor. Yeah. It's been marked for identification, trial exhibit 2375. and ask you to identify whether you are the author of that? Yes, I wrote the note. And that is your handwriting? Yes. And so, um, although... I don't see that it's dated, is it, in any place? It's not. But do you recall that whether this was written during the course of your stay at Johns Hopkins? It was written. And can you see that from what is written there, the descriptions? Yes. And in writing this, were you expressing your uh, existing, at that time, mental, emotional, and physical condition? Oh, you remember this text deleting? It's a minor. <clears throat> it's it's leading. Objection. Okay. What was, what was the purpose involving what, if any, involvement does the document reflect as to your mental, emotional, or physical condition, if you can look through it there? Well, at the time, I desperately missed my family. I wasn't allowed to really have any contact with them. So in this document, I'm expressing how much I miss them. I was extremely depressed. And in the little, as far as physical-wise, how I was doing, if you look, there's a heart. And in the heart is pictured my mom on the very far right, my brother, me in the wheelchair, and then on the very far left would be my dad. So it's showing that I'm still sick. Were you attempting at this point to address address your health while in there? Yes, and but you, I couldn't explicitly state it. Because what? I couldn't explicitly state it because they wouldn't have sent the document. Was that your intent, however? Yes. And did you state in there uh, the status of your pain? It's all leading, but uh, it's mine. they're giving latitude. It's okay, foundational. Shut down. I gave away all my copies. You can put it back on the screen. And yes, we're watching Fox 13 Tampa's coverage. When you say not doing the best, but I'm hanging in there, what were you addressing? I was trying to express that physically I wasn't doing very well. I was in a lot of pain with my CRPS. On top of that, I wasn't doing well mentally because, as, I mean, I was a kid and I was taken away from my family, so you can only imagine. During this period of time was uh, Dr. John Wassenauer, your pediatrician? Yes. And through the course of your stay there, did it come to your attention that your parents from time to time would keep him updated? I figured. I didn't know that entirely, but I could assume. Um, and did you trust your parents at that time, your mother or your father, to uh, provide information to your pediatrician about your status during the period of time when you could not directly communicate? Yes. Your witness. What are you going to cross her on? I'm sorry. Hey, good morning, Mike. Good morning. Um, just a couple quick questions. This guy's good. Uh, fireworks involving him later in the afternoon. Plaintiff's counsel is a little dry. This attorney is pretty good, but he kind of opens a door that he didn't anticipate this afternoon. Um, do you know the date that this was sent? I do not. I'm sorry. Okay. And if I understand what you were telling the court, the purpose of this letter was to communicate with your mom, dad, and your brother? Correct. Okay. Um, do you know if Dr. Wassenaar ever came to see you at All Children's? Do, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, yeah. Do you know if Dr. Wassenaar, your primary care pediatrician, ever came to see you at All Children's? I believe he did not. Thank you for your time. Anything further? Any See? Further? Perfect. Perfect. Boom, boom, boom. Ms. Kowalski, if you could go ahead and see. Thank you. Any further argument on this? Uh, I guess I'll start with the defense. We're not going to go through it. Judge lets it in. So uh, judge lets it in, says it's an existing mental state, um, which is an exception to the hearsay rule. So they are allowed to show Dr. Walsh of this, allowed to show the jury this. Um, if they want it in for different exceptions, they can raise that later. Now let's fast forward to the timestamp I've got is 3235. 3235. Are we still alive? Here we go. Dr. Wasser, the person you just heard, primary care physician for Maya Kowalski. This is the witness that took the stand first today. Let's hear some of his background. Please, Mayor. Please state your name for the record. 
John Wassner. And have you been called here as the Kowalski's uh, family doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, and so have you treated then Maya Kowalski, Kyle Kowalski, and before her passing, Piotr Kowalski? I have. Uh, just curiously, have you ever treated Jack Kowalski? Not to my knowledge. So I'd like to get a, the jury to know a little bit about you. You grew up in St. Petersburg, is that correct? Yes, sir. And then attended St. Pete College University of Florida? Yes, sir. And you did a mixed uh, internship residency in pediatrics and internal medicine? I did a dual combined residency in adult internal medicine and pediatrics. And where did you do university. that? And where did you do that? Duke University. So these two specializations, uh, can you tell the jury just a tiny bit about the, the, the two choices you made, pediatrics and internal medicine, what you wanted to do in your career? Okay, so basically, um, they're the, the program is the same as a conventional pediatric program and an adult internal medicine program. <clears throat> it just combines the requirements of both programs into an accelerated um, training, if you will. We have to sit for the same boards as straight adult internal medicine physicians do and the same boards as uh, straight pediatric physicians do. Um, my original intention when I was making my way through medical school was to do pediatrics, but after an experience on an externship in the islands, I came back and uh, Duke happened to send me a, a flyer on their program for internal medicine and pediatrics, and that's what I decided was for me because I enjoyed the spectrum of seeing um, babies up to the geriatrics. It, it was really appealed to me. It's gratifying. And what are the uh, additional or different attributes, qualifications in dealing with children over adults that you have noticed? And I'm speaking of this in terms of why you chose pediatrics. Um, okay. First comment comes early. This lawyer, he has difficulty asking simple questions. There's a way to get there. He wants this doctor to testify as to how he chose pediatrics, why pediatrics is different, why he chose this specialty. He asked three questions in one sentence. That was compound and challenging. And my gosh, for those of you asking me to turn this up, I can't. I'm at full volume here and I don't have closed captions. Law and Crimes morning footage is not up. So we're stuck with this until the afternoon. Thank you for being patient. Patient. Ultimately, this doctor is not the most significant witness we'll get today. And I'll explain a little bit later why I think the jury is not really going to listen to him um, based on the cross. So, uh, these lawyers, these, well, this lawyer continues down this line of questions. It's just so much trouble, so much trouble asking the question in a simple fashion. We'll hear a few more and it's going to drive me nuts. Well, yeah, I was bad question. Let me know. I'm down to ask <laughs> a little confused. Um, I always tell my um, patients and, and people who ask, you know, why do you do that? You know, I say it's the two ends, the, the young and the very old that are similar. It's the people in between that are different. And so it's really not that much of a, um, of a stretch. You just have to keep in mind where people are at this point in time in their growth and development. Uh, and are you board certified in both? Yes, sir. And how long have you been board certified? <sighs> 33 years. And how long have you been in practice? 33 years. So, uh, so the jury knows our, your group is called First Physicians of Sarasota. Yes, right? sir. And is that part of Sarasota Memorial Hospital? Yes, sir. And through that, do you, uh, have you and do you still uh, do your own pediatric hospital work? Um, up until 2018, we admitted uh, to both hospitals, everything from pediatrics to adult internal medicine. Now the group, uh, our inpatient work is limited to newborns. How many years did you spend practicing in hospitals in the sense of uh, admissions following patients there? Um, so that would be probably 28. And over the course of your career, have you had the opportunity to treat patients with CRPS? I had uh, a couple of adult patients. Uh, mine was my first pediatric patient. Want you guys to note that, note that he's he's had adult patients he's treated with CRPS. Maya was the first first minor that he's treated with CRPS. Outside of CRPS, have you treated cro other chronic pain patients? Absolutely, it's a big part of the practice. And so, um, did there come a time that Maya Kowalski and the Kowalskis, uh, Kyle, Maya, Viata, became patients of yours? Um, they, in 2014, 2015. Yes. All right. And so. Through the course, and do you continue to treat them to this day? I do. Approx approximately how often do you see them? Uh, depends on what's going on. Um, recently, maybe once or twice a year. Okay. And then up until, let's say, uh, the summer of 2015, uh, how would you describe Maya's health? 
it was good. She was, wasn't um, different than a lot of my other pediatric practice. She had asthma, she had some allergy issues, but that's pretty common in pediatrics. Now, as a pediatrician, are you required by the state of Florida that if you see any signs of, uh, confirmed signs of child abuse that you have to report? Absolutely. Gorillas. Gorillas. You can answer the question. Sorry? You can answer the question. Yes, sir. I'm compelled to report it. Tell the jury about Bianca Kowalski from uh, the times that you saw her and know her. Uh, what was she like in your professional view as a mother? As a mother, she was uh, very attentive and I feel very loving towards her family and her children. Um, very concerned about them always when I saw her. Did you ever see at any time any indications whatsoever that Beata Kowalski contained any signs, warning signs, troublesome indications that would indicate that she might be in any way abusive to either of her children? No. So then as the, uh, the care progressed then, did there come a time when Maya started to have unusual pain symptoms? That was after her July admission, you know, uh, everything started. Okay. And so... Um, Let's look at, if we can, 1066-003. And we can pull it up here for you back, I think. And the date of this, for the record, is a visit of September 2nd, 2015. Yes, sir. And we've got this before you here. So what was going on with Maya at this time, just generally? Well, according to my note, that this was a um, follow-up of a series of ER visits and hospital visits. Um, and I was, she had had asthma exacerbations and was, had been requiring steroids and had actually been admitted um, to all children's on July uh, 7, 2015 with an asthma exacerbation. Does it say there how long she was? And I'm not sure it does. I'm not suggesting that it does, but. She was discharged on the 11th, it says. All right, so four days there at John Hopkins. Mm -hmm. All right, and so uh, it says here, she's had tre tremendous difficulties with pain control requiring high levels of analgesia. Um, and did you see her then at this time and physically examine her on September 2nd, 2015? Uh, yes, I did examine her. And what did the examination reveal, if anything? Can you pop up to the next page, please? Yes, that would help. All right. That, uh, basically, I did not um, have any uh, focal findings on that particular time. All right. Now, it says there, steroid-induced in myopathy with severe intractable pain. Now, at this point, had anyone ID'd, if you will, CRPS? No, sir. That's your knowledge. And had you seen Maya enough times at this point to be able to strike that? Had she expressed enough symptoms to you at that time to be able to uh, diagnose that? No, sir. And then it says here at the bottom, number eight, behavioral disturbance with possible conversion disorder. Can you tell the jury whether during the time that you saw Maya, either here? All right. Attorney has to get this. We're going to mention this really quickly. So this is the first appearance at this hospital. So in July, the hospital admission, the relevant portions here are, it's a rather brief admission. July, I believe, 7th, discharged on the 11th. So relatively short stay, reports a lot of pain, uh, not really sure what the diagnosis is. And then this doctor on this examination says behavioral disturbance and possible conversion disorder. Conversion disorder is the beginning of this argument the hospital begins having on Munchausen's by proxy. So the plaintiff has to address this immediately with this particular doctor. I'm going to fast forward a bit to some of the discharge instructions because we've got a lot to cover and there's really not a whole lot here. And we'll get to why I don't really think this doctor added anything is during the cross-examination because um, they're just, I think he's going to have credibility issues in a minute. Um, not credibility in the terms of, I don't believe him. But credibility in the terms of he, the the defense did a pretty good job of, of indicating there there might be motivation. Uh, rather, he's he might be pulling for one side. So let's get towards the discharge. There's findings that um, I don't think that was the whole answer. Is long and short. Okay. All right. Uh, and so then uh, she is uh, seen by another pedi pediatric GI. I'm trying to skip ahead. So here. later in the year. Um, and then. Uh, it says there's something about the parents. Can you tell tell the jury what was going on with Mr. and Mrs. Kowalski? Um, so they were frustrated at, with the GI visit. Um, and that we'll get there, Lily Wayne. Her symptoms were being addressed. Um, and I made the comment that um, Jack and Bianca were taking turns attending my at night as her sleep was greatly disturbed and she would wake up with pain requiring the attendance of her parents. So both parents were having um, their sleep significantly shortened and attenuated by the ongoing symptoms. Were the parents under stress at this point? Absolutely. And uh, is that an unusual state for parents of a child with a uh, painful <clears throat> condition? Absolutely not. Any any parent who's seen their child suffer and, and feels like they don't they haven't gotten adequate resolution or control of that is going to be extremely stressed until that situation is met. 
Now, underneath the current medications, can you tell the jury uh, whether, uh, and on the next page, plan, it also talks, what I'm trying to decide, inform the jury of is what meds were you and what meds did you receive back from, uh, that had been previously described by all children or someone else? Okay, so. Was there a question there? No, there wasn't a question there. What I'm trying to describe, this, uh, the other plaintiff's attorney I like much more, much more than this. This attorney seems very, he's having difficulty navigating this. He's too close to this case. He's too close to this case. Um, again, you see now we're in, what's this? Now this is October. So let's go ahead and fast forward to, uh, uh, where is we? We're at one. To do 124 26. Let me see if I can't get us there. Closer to where we start getting the rubber meets road. Administrations of Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, not great, but she was grateful to be out of the hospital. Okay. And uh, it says that uh, in the middle there, Maya continues to have great difficulties and is in worse physical shape than when she went in. Yes, you see that? Was that your observation at the time? Observation. Sorry for the constant pausing, guys. It's just reading stuff on pages, and I'm 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 gonna read it. I'm gonna read it so you guys can hear it because it's kind of quiet. So this is this doctor's report, and this is on January 18th of 2017. And this doctor, Dr. Wassenaar, starts to opine more freely on what his perspective is in this history of present illness. The patient is 11 year old white female who presents with hospital follow up for hospital follow up. Maya, Maya has had a terrible ordeal. Already, there's a bit of injection. She was admitted to All Children's Hospital on October 7th, 2016, with an exacerbation of her reflex symptomatic dystrophy and complex regional pain syndrome. So CRPS has been diagnosed at this point. Through a series of unfortunate events, CPS gets steps in and removes custody of Maya from her parents. There's also, I mean, the jury can read this. There's opinion interlaced in there. They accuse the mother of Munchausen's by proxy as well as labeling the child as having a thick tissue disorder or a conversion disorder. Someone asked what conversion disorder is. Conversion disorder is um, Munchausen's by proxy. Basically, someone has uh, converted. They've, they've made you believe that you have this disorder. Um, she's literally been hospitalized for the last 90 days. So at this point in time in January, we're talking about 90 days prior to that, that she's been in the hospital, all while the parents work diligently to try to regain custody. This doctor has opinions. The opinions are coming through in the medical records. I paused this when this was playing in real time because I wanted to read it. These opinions are what I am laying out to a jury if I'm on defense side as being opinions that might undermine the objectivity of the doctor. Unfortunately, Maya's mother committed... Maya's mother had self unalived on January 7th. So 11 days prior to this report. So the opinions are kind of, they're there for a reason. When her last appeal was denied, Maya continues to have great difficulties and is in worse physical shape than when she went in. Prior to being admitted, she was able to push herself around the house in wheelchairs and do transfers back and forth from chair to wheelchair. She's currently not able to do this and has great tenderness and sensitivity to lower, and lower extremities. She complains of pain diffusely um, she is seeing a psychologist at an organization called Eagles Wings and is starting physical therapy five days a week through Agility PT. That becomes relevant later. She's doing pool therapy on her own twice a week. A GAL, Guardian Ad Litem, has been appointed to the case as a caseworker is visiting the house on a regular basis. GAL is the lawyer appointed for the child. Litigation is still in progress. So that's where things stand as of January 18th of 2017. And all of this is... is this is the report. This is what you have in the medical records. Um, no, it's not, Trisha Lynn. I know. I'm kind of dumbing it down. Uh, it, we get when we get to doctor later. It's a uh, it's a little bit more clear. A conversion disorder, different. Yes, different, 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 different. Um, and I am not a medical doctor, guys. I just see some of these. I use these in different cases where we're arguing about this stuff. Uh, let's get to the cross. So remember that letter we talked about? Here it is. Um, sent to me um, by Viata after after uh, the protective order was put in place. All right. And then um, did you? why did you place this in your file? Um, just because I thought it underscored that, you know, she wasn't being abused, that people weren't doing things to her that she, you know, put her in pain and was, I mean, her. it, it underscored to me 
how much she loved her parents and how much she wanted to be reunited with them. Did it advise you of her um, medical and emotional condition? Yes. And this has been previously admitted, Judge? Yes. Uh, permission to publish the original to the jury, uh, but I need to show the witness first to elaborate on what's in the back. May I approach? Uh, one, two, three, four. The clerk has the original. Now, on the back side of this, um, are there any entrants there that you noted? There, there was some um, areas of increased coloration that were, I assume, corresponding to the kids that she was sending to her family. Uh, permission to publish this one? You may. Yes, Taiji girl, it is, but YouTube Again, members, monitors that you speech and yeah, it's, in the, um, it's annoying. We deliberate. So this is not the only time you get to see this or any of the other exhibits. Not a whole lot more with this one. So we're going to fast forward to the cross because that's that's where I think this this witness, um, that's relevant part of this. So 209, you guys, I, like I said, timestamps are gonna, it's, it's gonna be a struggle today. I'm sorry, I will try to, uh, um, good point from one of my mods. Guys, please don't put the word, please don't put certain words that YouTube does not like in the chat. Uh, this is, Look, I'm a lawyer. I deal with words that are complicated all day, every day. I have no problem talking about those particular words, but I'm not YouTube. In order for people to see this stream, in order for people to see this content, I have to play by their rules. It's frustrating. I have to play by their rules, and their rules are uh, if, if they start seeing words like that pop up in chat, uh, they start flagging the video. That's the hard part. If they start seeing those words pop up in chat, they start flagging the video. So I I use different code words when I discuss this stuff because not me, not because I'm sensitive to it, but honestly, because YouTube, their little robots will catch stuff left, right, and center, and they'll start flagging the stream. So I'm sorry. I, I wish I could, and I wish I could have a direct discussion with you guys about it, but this is the only way I can have it. So that's that's what we're going we're gonna to have to do. Let's get on to the cross of Dr. Uh, Wasserman. Okay, everyone, please be seated. <clears throat> Members of the jury, I want to confirm while you were away, you did not discuss this case amongst yourselves. You did no investigation and received no information. Is that all correct? Yeah. Yes. Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Your Honor. Please go ahead. You come before we have a death warrant now? Sorry, sir. You have a death warrant? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Let's kind of get a couple things for the way up front of the jury. You've been treating with the Walton family with the exception of chat for several years, correct? Yes, and um, you agreed to appear here to testify on their behalf, correct? Yes, sir. Did you have occasion to meet with Mr. Anderson before you appeared here today? I did. Okay. And he had a discussion with you about what your testimony would consist of? We, we had some discussion about possible things that we discussed. Yes, well, sir. he asked you to review some records for him, correct? Yes, sir. And testify about those records? Yes, sir. Right. And, and you are appearing here today as an advocate for the Kowalski family. Is that right? Yes, sir. So you're not just a witness. Right there. What are we in? 60 seconds into cross? 60 seconds into cross? Don't worry. He'll repeat it. 60 seconds into cross. You are appearing here today as an advocate for the Kowalski family. That's the hard part. That's the hard part. Because what that does to the jury, and it's it's the attorney's choice of words, man. It's the attorney's choice of words. And the attorney chose those words really carefully, really carefully. And it was it was the response was so quick that the second I heard it, I I just about fast forwarded through the rest of the, the rest of the testimony. Because it's that advocate word. You're an advocate for their cause. So any semblance of, of objectivity that the jury could read into those notes, 
if I am the defense counsel, what I am going to do in closing argument is I'm going to hit that word advocate nine million times. And there goes any credibility to that testimony. That, that to me was, that was a devastating blow to the defense, devastating blow to the defense or to the plaintiff, to the plaintiff's counsel, to plaintiff's counsel. Yes, twisted puppet. You know what? You're right. You are 100% right. Yes, but you do want your doctor to be an advocate. You do, twisted puppet. You absolutely do. You absolutely do. You want your doctor to be your advocate, but when you're asking a jury to judge whether the conduct that was undertaken was reasonable on an objective level, whether there were objective reasons to uh, make a report, whether there were objective reasons, where, whether a reasonable doctor could have interpreted something um, in a way that was different from yours. When you, when you go out and you say that I, you know, you're an advocate and the lawyer chose those words really carefully. And I, we don't have, we don't have eyes on, we don't have eyes on the, the, the plaintiffs or the defense counsel table or a plaintiff's counsel table, but I'm, I imagine there's some frustration there. And it's not just that he said it once, just, just wait for a second. I'll rewind it. I'll rewind it so we can hear the beginning and then wait for another second. You're an advocate. Correct. We, we had some discussion about possible things that we discussed yesterday. Well, they asked you to review some records for them, correct? Yes, sir. And justify about this, right? Yes, sir. Right. And, and you are appearing here today as an advocate for the Kowalski family. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So you're not just a witness, you're an advocate. Yes, sir. Um, let me take you back, if I could. You're not just a witness, you're to, an advocate. Um, the first time that you saw Maya Kowalski. That was in 2014? Yes, sir. I don't want to belabor this, but she came in at that point to just establish a relationship, a, a new pediatrician involved. Yes, sir. Right. And she came in with a diagnosis of asthma, correct? Yes, sir. And she had an action plan for the asthma. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, did you ever get her records from her previous physician? I have a copy of their action plan. Mm -hmm. Would you ever get her records from a previous physician? Uh, I don't think I had anything from um, Larry from the Chicago. Okay. Oh, sorry. Well, you never talked to her previous physician who was transferring care to you, did you? No, sir. I did not. Right. Now, just for kind of a baseline here and for future reference, um, what was, I've got 1066-1, but the only reason I mentioned that is to call attention to the weight at that time. What was the date of that, sir? That was uh, 1125, check that, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. 1125-14. Yes, sir. 25.3 kilos. Yes, sir. Is your math good at that 2.2 times conversion <laughs> better than mine? I have it converted simply, sir. It's about 64 pounds, isn't it? Okay, let's see what I did with that. It's even lighter. Do that, but oh, there it is. Anastasia, I agree with this. I wish the camera didn't 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 go back to her every single time. There are three plaintiffs. Fifty five point seven pounds. And that's as of your first visit with her. Yes, sir. And then you didn't see her again until September of two thousand fifteen. Or June 19th, 2015. I'm sorry? Oh, no, that was my partner. You're, you're scared, correct. Yes, um, so at that time, back in 2015, I think you told counsel that you were um, that you were on, you were still doing hospital work. practice, yes, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned something about you were on the medical staff at both hospitals. Yes, sir. That would be both Sarasota Memorial and doctors? No, sir. That would be the two campuses of uh, oh, Sarasota Memorial. Mm -hmm. Did you have privileges at doctors? No, sir. So were you aware at all of her at her ER visits and admissions to Doctors Hospital in the summer of 2015? Um, I don't think I had records of that until she came in to see me in September. Did you know she had been to Venice Hospital in 2015, in the summer of 2015? Um, I don't have those records, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, well, but I was, aware, I was aware that she had been to you, you, were, been, you weren't called in consultation to see her no, either doctors or dentists, correct? No, sir. And when she went to Sarasota Memorial, you weren't called there either, correct? No, sir. And were you par a part of her admission to all children's well, the two or three admissions she had in July of 2015. Yes, sir. You, you weren't involved at all. Yes, sir. Correct. And, and you weren't involved in her final admission in July of 2015 at all children's before she went to Lurie's, correct? Correct. Okay. And can we agree that that, but, but you did get the records from those? Yes, sir. And you did see the discharge summaries from those? 
Um, not all of them, but I've seen some of them for sure. Well, when you saw this patient in September, she had not just had those several admissions to all children's, and, then, and she had not just had this generalized pain that she presented to you with. Mm -hmm. She had also been to Lurie's Children's Hospital, correct? Yes, sir. And did you have any records at all from Lurie's? Not that I recollect, sir. Did you have any indication from Lurie's of the psychologists and pain management folks who saw her there? Not at that time that I saw her in September. Okay. And that was after she was discharged from all children's, correct? From the, the July admission, sir? Right. Yes, sir. And then she went from Lurie's to Tampa General, correct? Yes, sir, for physical therapy. Okay. And she was under the care there of a Dr. Kornberg? I've never seen the name yet, sir. Okay. Do you, do you know who Dr. Kornberg is? No, sir. Do you know he's a pediatric? Uh, I have no knowledge of Dr. Kornberg. have no knowledge of it. Okay. Did you know that she saw a psychologist and a psychiatrist at Tampa General? I was aware. Mm -hmm. And you know what her discharge diagnosis from Tampa General was? I don't have those records in front of me, but I think it was conversion or somatization or something to that effect. Okay. So when she presented to you in, on September 2nd, 2015, you had not seen all the discharge summaries from her, her admissions to all children. You had no knowledge of Lurie's. And you had Tampa General's discharge, but you hadn't really read it. Is that a fair characterization? That's fair. Okay. And you knew in general that there was a suspicion at Tampa General after a month of hospitalization. Okay. And this is why this is devastating. This was a methodical deconstruction of his direct testimony. His direct testimony was in in crux. Like the if I were to basically boil it down to what the import of his testimony was, was he was explaining the deterioration of Maya during the hospital stay and then saying that that the hospital started excluding his opinion when they kept on going. The hospital didn't ask about what he had seen in the past as they were issuing these diagnoses going forward. Now, the question that I have, or the question rather, was, well, not, let me rephrase this. I got distracted by something in the chat. His primary complaint was that he had observed things that would have explained away the diagnosis of Munchausen's by proxy or the conversion diagnosis. He had observed things that he wished they would have considered. The problem with this cross-examination is this attorney is methodically, point by point, walking through the various things that he did not consider from past diagnoses before he made his diagnosis. So, when I go back through this, and again, the primary treating physician isn't really the person that's going to control the outcome of this case one way or the other. People expect that that primary treating physician is going to have an opinion, and they're going to expect if the plaintiff is bringing the case, that opinion is going to align pretty closely with the plaintiff. So his testimony, I didn't think was the be all end all. It's not the most important part of the plaintiff's case. I just think the plaintiff had an opportunity to make some more points with it. And the defense did a really good job of knocking each one of those points down. But that's that. Look, we're in the morning. Trials are going to go both ways. You're going to see points scored on both sides of the board. So people are going to have opinions. And I get it. You guys are reasonable. You guys are likely jurors in most jurisdictions. So I'm, I'm not going to dispute that you guys might have a different opinion than what I'm seeing. What I'm saying is that from a from a litigation standpoint, um, these were things that I would have gone over over and over and over again to make sure that they, I mean, I would, this witness, I don't know, would have, would have presented as, as agreeable as, um, as he was made to present. So, uh, and there was a question that I saw in here that I wanted to catch very difficult. Um, not difficult. You and Ian are both covering this right now. We are. We're both covering the same topic. We actually talked about this before. I'm not going to overlap with him, but I need a break. He needs a break. So if I can't do a recap, he might do a recap. Um, that's, that's, we've, we've talked about this case quite a bit. Uh, Crazy Cat Queen, thank you for the super chat. Conversion disorder is when the patient's mind without awareness causes the body to have physical symptoms. I've seen some doozies the patients do suffer. I, I don't dispute that. Their brain is basically saying it's, it's essentially, um, yeah, gosh, the doctors don't shred me in the chat. Please don't shred me in the chat. I'm going to try and break this down in a very, very simplified form. Psychoses, something going on in your, in your mental state, something psychological, psychological is telling you that you have significant pain. Psychological, you have significant pain, but it's something that we can, uh, through cognitive behavioral therapy, we might be able to address it. We might be able to deconstruct it. We might be able to get you back to a place where you don't feel pain. 
CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, not so much, not psychological, it's neurological. It's the synapses. It is basically your nervous system that is firing off those pain receptors that you are actually experiencing those pains. It's not your, it's not the psychological part of your brain telling you I'm having pain. It's actually physical pain that you are experiencing mentally in your brain. Um, that is the dumbest way of explaining it that I can think of. I am not a doctor. This is my lay understanding of it. Please don't shred me. I'm just trying to make this explanation from the standpoint of why it matters for this particular case. Psychological, you begin cognitive behavioral therapy. Neurological, you take other steps. Crazy Cat Queen coming in again. Thank you. Rob, do you know if Johns Hopkins consulted with psychiatry uh, for Maya, given the insistence in, of conversion? Ooh, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. That's that's the star witness. That's the star witness of today, the afternoon witness. Um and I do, we have to get through that. So I'm going to speed up a little bit. Crazy Cat Queen, um, again, thank you for being so opinionated and for expressing those respectfully. This is why primary care is considered the red herring, redheaded stepchildren of medicine because no hospitalist or specialist respects us enough to let us know when our patients end up in the ER and hospital. You're right. Um, it's sad. They should be consulted more. Hospitals have become very bureaucratic, very bureaucratic. This, this hospital's bureaucracy might be, is, is kind of one of the reasons why they're in trouble. And we'll get to that in the afternoon witness. Thank you, Crazy Cat Queen, for the input there. Um, SP, seriously, I want to know why no one considered CRPS RSD sooner. I had medical training. I would have considered it pretty soon after the onset. It didn't take long, just two months. Um, it's, the, it's the fact that she's a minor and didn't have prior injury. Most of the CRPS that I'm aware of shows up after an injury. Um, but that was that might have been some delay. Chris Cat Queen, thank you. Thick tissue disorder is a mistranscription of the docs or report supposed to be uh, facetious disorder. Okay. Um, Matt Bond, thank you for the super chat. Sucks it took this to get the potential C the CRPS. I've gone through this for 16 years. It's a global issue. CRPS is more common than they think. Matt, the reason one of the reasons I like this case, and one of the reasons I don't mean to say I like this case, one of the reasons I'm covering this case, I have a friend who's affected by CRPS. He was involved in an injury. He was injured um, in his late 20s and uh, had a leg injury and sustained that. And ever since that leg injury has suffered from complex regional pain syndrome. And there are months when he's the it's like it doesn't affect him at all. But then there are months when, um, as he explains it, his leg is literally on fire. Uh, and we don't know enough about it. We don't really know how to treat it except for numbing it. So we're we're still trying to figure out how to do it. Um, Veronica, thank you for the member chat. Lawyers slowly getting me annoyed. Plaintiff's counsel is kind of slow. Uh, happy any. Thanks for covering this case. It's a hard one. It is. Azam, thank you for being here. Thanks for this month's membership. Two of my favorite uh, law, what? law, chat, and chat. Law, CH, and chat. Okay. My second favorite law. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Lawyer You Know is going to be your favorite. I have no problem with that. I love Lawyer You Know. Peter and I are good friends. XCDA, I'm struggling with this one. The issues hit a sensitive spot in me. Not sure how to feel about it. That is exactly fair. And that is something I want to highlight this case is going to make people feel a certain way they're going to make people feel a certain way you're allowed to feel that way like i said this is a fact specific case we are focusing on the facts of this case it shouldn't demean how you address the things going on in your life okay so we're going to be very very careful here because there are people i know that are suffering from there are people I know who've had bad interactions with CPS and child protective services. People I know, well, rather people that I know in circumstances I know where CPS saved the life of the child. There are two sides to every coin, and we're going to be respectful. So, uh, fast forwarding on, because we do have to get through our next witness. We are going to pre-1921. Now we're getting into Maya's religion because religion and denial of religious uh, observance was something that 
is a point of contention here. The argument from the plaintiff, just a forewarning argument from the plaintiff, is that the hospital denied Maya the right to exercise her religion, um, that they denied it. The hospital is relying on a defense that DCF, children and families, that the children and families were the ones that entered the order that said no. So there's a conflict in who was the one that said you can't practice the faith. So this witness coming up as a foundational witness to kind of demonstrate how important the faith was. Good morning, Ms. Barrow. Would you please state your full name for the record? Linda Suzanne Martin, I'm from David Brown. And you and I have spoken on a couple of occasions, but we've never met in person, have we? Not till today, sir. Have you been called here to testify as a member of Epiphany Church? Not really. Are you a member of Epiphany Yes, Church? I am. Are you also a member of the Legion of Mary? I am. And this lawyer already, this is the other plaintiff's counsel, already off to a better start. So much better at getting the questions and redirecting questions. So much better at witness interaction. He should be examining more of the complex witnesses. And on occasion. And I love the hat. The hat's phenomenal. You come to know the Kowalski family. A little bit through Sister Francis, yes. Just briefly, would you give the jury um, background in terms of how long you've been a resident in Venice and how long you've been a member of the church? Um, I've been in Venice since 1997. I've been a member of the church pretty much since then because I had my daughter in '98, so we became members full time when we had her. And the Legion of Mary, would you explain for the jury what the Legion of Mary is? Uh, there's two groups for the Legion of Mary. The first group is the um, the main group that meets every week. They have uh, meetings and discussions about places to go and people to see, to, to help and pray for, for whatever their needs might be. They also have um, what they call a traveling Mary or a pilgrim Mary. She's about um, three feet tall. And she comes in a big kind of black box, almost looks like a, um, a golf club kind of bag, but it's, it's all square. You know, it's long and rectangular. Um, and she comes in the box and she has a beautiful crown that, she puts, that we put on her head. And there's a ceremony that goes with it with the book that's inside of this box, all contained with Mary. Um, they put rosary, we put rosaries around her neck, and then we pray with the family. Um, we engage them with certain prayers that are in this book to um, leave the Mary with them so that they continue to do the rosary with this pilgrim Mary who's present in their home. And she's there for healing and hope and health and gives a lot of us Catholics a, a whole lot of hope. Okay. So, caveat to the chat. Let's pull this down for a second. Caveat to the chat. This is about the fundamental right to practice religion. It's not so much about whether you believe the practices will or will not work. It's about your right to practice religion, how you wish to practice it. And for those of you guys who know, I'm Catholic. I'm a converted Catholic. Uh, struggle with the faith sometimes. But what this is going to say is it's going to kind of demonstrate that Catholicism wasn't just a little bit important to her. It's that when you're denying this, you're not just saying, no, you don't get to do A, B, C, D, E. It's you are denying some primary tenets to the faith. So this was a big foundational issue. They had to get over this and they had to put on a witness that could kind of explain this. So it didn't come across as so outside the pale, like, why is this important? You know, why is it important that the priest can't give uh, communion? Why is it important the priests can't bring in relics? Because it's demonstrating that the family in their observance, this child in her observance, this, this family has placed a great deal of faith in their faith in, in ha having healing powers. And just because you're administering care on a physical level, if you are denying them access to that faith while doing so, are you really justified in doing that arbitrarily? Um, also, random point, two people have opinions about the hat. Let me see. Let me pull this back up. Some people say uh, hat distracting, hat phenomenal. Either way, if I was the attorney for the plaintiff, I would have advised against the hat. She wants to wear the hat. She's she's good. Uh, a lot of um, uh, a lot of devout Catholics will will still cover their hair. They will cover their hair. So that might be part of it. I'm not going to go and explain why, um, but I do know a lot of Catholics that still cover their hair. Let's see. Going on. So basically what we've got from this witness so far is that part of the congregation traveled to the home and they brought 
a they brought a statue of Mary and they they began prayers in that fashion, um, prayers for healing calling upon Mary for her intercession in the healing of this particular child and these injuries. So this is what was happening outside of the hospital. Uh, do, do, do. And if it's a faith-based exception, that's the only thing I can think of KPT has a lot in court. I think it might be a faith-based exception. But uh, we'll listen to a bit more of what she says on direct as far as how this goes forward what i want you to listen to is the uh the attorney his style his style this is plaintiff's counsel his style is so much more suited for litigation i very much prefer his style to the other attorney you happen to live in stonewall which is the kowalski's neighborhood right it is and did there come a time in 2015 when you learned that that maya had a pain condition of some sort was it 2015? Gosh, was that long ago? Um, I from Sister Francis. I was at church with Sister Francis. Um, we used to go. I used to went to daily mass when they had it then. And um, excuse me, I don't need to. Do it fine. Yes, I just need to breathe. Sister Francis was speaking to someone about saying prayers for the Kowalskis, and she saw me and said, "They live in your neighborhood." And I said, "Oh, I will bring them the traveling Mary because they." Uh, Sister Francis was telling me that their daughter was ill, and my heart went out to her, so I wanted to bring Mary there so that they all could pray for the healing of their daughter. And so did you take the Mary, the mother Mary to the Kowalski's house? I did. That, and that was the first time I met Beata. And um, I went into the home and um, her sister was there from Chicago. I did not see Maya at the time. And th the husband was there as well. And they were getting ready to go somewhere for some function. So normally when you come into the house with this traveling Mary, you do the whole ceremony with the family and you set her up. Yeah, yeah. I'll wait for the next question. All right, so you went to the home, you met Beata, you met Jack, Maya, you didn't see her. You brought in the Mother Mary. What is, you explained a little bit, but what is the normal process that you go through with the family when you unbox her and set her up? We unbox her and put her in a prominent place. And then we put the crown on her head and the rosaries around her neck. And we say the prayers that are in this particular book that comes with. And, and the family gets um, books as well so that they can all look at the prayers so they can say them together. And on that occasion, you already mentioned that the Kowalski family was on their way out or something. So did you go through the ceremony with them at their house or did you leave Mother Mary and trust that they would do that? I left Mary with them to trust that they would do that. And then how long does Mother Mary typically stay in a family's home or a sick parishioner's home after you deliver her? A week or if, you know, she's not in need for someone else, if they need her longer, it can be extended. So it's the duration is, um, you know, who needs her next and who's waiting for her or um, who needs her the most at the moment. Did... Uh, Beata and Jack appear appreciative that you were there with the Mother Mary? Oh, yes, absolutely. And after a week, did you pick Mother Mary up or someone else? No, sir. Meaning someone else picked her up? Yes, sir. Okay. And so that was in 2015. And then uh, fast forward a little bit, sometime in 2016, you saw Maya during the Fourth of July parade. Is that right? That is correct. Can you tell us a little bit about your interaction with the Kowalskis on the Fourth of July, 2016? Well, it was our whole neighborhood, and it was the Kowalski family and the, other, and the family across the street, and they intertwined. And there was a big, huge slide. And um, my immediate thing I first went to do was to go see Maya. And I did. She was um, in her wheelchair. And I gave her a big hug. And I thought she could. She looked so well. I thought that she could just get up out of the wheelchair any day. Um, and I gave her a, a stick of huckleberry chapstick um, and gave her a big hug and just continued to be at the party. And So typical 4th of July in your neighborhood with the parade. And you saw Maya that day. Is that right? I did. And then is it true that the next time you interact with the Kowalski family was when you got a phone call from Beata? That is correct. What was Beata's mental and emotional state at that point? She was absolutely distraught. Um, could you understand what she was telling you on the phone? No, I could not, which is why I went over there to speak with her so I could try to understand what she was saying to me. And what did you learn? when you got to the Kowalski home that day? That Maya had been taken away from. Good question. She didn't have, she didn't have actual knowledge. Good question was, what did you learn? And it avoided the objection and it got to this answer. Yeah. And so you resolved to do what you do and deliver the mother Mary? Joyce and I were bringing um, the traveling Mary to Maya 
Um, I'll, I'll, let me ask the question. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's okay. You drove the Kowalski home. The auto's distraught. What did you decide to do uh, to help Maya? I went over to see Viata because she couldn't speak over the phone and I, I didn't know what was wrong. And when I got there, she was crying and, you know, snots everywhere and just so upset. And I kept saying, she kept saying that they, they took her and I'm like, who took her? And she said the hospital took her. And I didn't understand any of that. It's hearsay. Uh, excited utterance, then existing mental state. Dead. I like the attorney. He was prepped for it. I don't know that he satisfied that that uh, that exception, excited utterance, because this is now going to go into a monologue, um, a monologue of what was discussed during this period of time. Excited utterance is something like, oh, my gosh, that car just hit me like you are in that moment. That car just hit me. That's what an excited utterance is. An excited utterance isn't basically saying I'm in this heightened mental state and emotional state. Everything that I say in this mental and emotional state is going to come in as evidence. Also, uh, since when do uh, trial attorneys have like gaming laptops? That's set up behind Maya. That's is that Alienware. Like that's a that's a that's a high power laptop. Anyways, that was distraction. Um. Yes, the judge, the yes, the camera loves to focus on my I see your comment, Mary Jane. I get frustrated by it too. She is the plaintiff, and there's no defendant for them to focus on. Um, in the afternoon session, they start to focus a little bit more on dad. Um, I think they were getting comments, but I, I haven't really appreciated it very much. But she's been very, very good at the witness table. She has not done anything as far as these random side eye. She's done very, very, very well at the witness table. Honestly, this this young girl, uh, this young lady, this young woman um, acts uh, with a level of maturity that I wish 90% of my family law clients uh, in, employed. So, um, yeah. Um, but, yeah, so this lawyer was quick on his feet with a response to the objection. And now we get the entire monologue. If, come on, come on, behave. You were saying the hospital took her, you can continue. And I didn't understand what she was talking about at all. I, I didn't understand that. So I was just sitting there with her to just, you know, help her breathe. And um, then Jack came home and I left to let two of them be together. In the next couple of days or the following week, did you decide to then deliver Mother Mary to Maya? Yes, we decided that we would go, um, we would bring her to the traveling Mary to the hospital that Maya was in. Sure. Sidebars are pretty quick here. And the, the, the white noise sound in the courtroom is about as loud as it is in the Debbie Heard case. So. Come on, get us past sidebar. Um, your decision to take Mother Mary to Maya. And you said we, Who, who's we? Joyce Sacco and myself. And, and who is Joyce Sacco? Is she not a member of the Legion of Mary? She is a, a member of the Legion of Mary. All right. So uh, you knew at that point that Maya was at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, and you made a drive up there. Can you describe a little bit the drive up there? Uh, we, I, I drove with Joyce um, in her vehicle, and we just prayed the entire way. We didn't discuss anything because we didn't know anything other than we were praying to help a little girl who was sick. That's all we knew. And you arrive at the hospital, and you get up to Maya's room, and if you could describe the scene as you enter Maya's room. Uh, I went in a room and she was sitting there crisscross applesauce and I went over to her and she reached up to me and I hugged her and um, then we were what happened next? Uh, just like darkness was there and we were told to get out of the room we weren't supposed to be in there we uh, weren't supposed to, I wasn't supposed to be touching Maya and that um, what was the what, what did we what were we bringing what was that we tried to explain that it was um, you know the miraculous you know Mother Mary and that we were bringing her to be with Maya so that she could pray and they said that was not allowed and that we had to go so we left the room. And who's they? Doc nurses or doctors? Just whatever that dark force was behind me. I didn't really. It just was dark. That's that's all the only way I can explain it. And it, it was explained to them. You mentioned this is the Mother Mary. She's here to pray with Maya. Is that right? That Maya would pray with her, yes. And so did they give you any reason that you couldn't be there with her? They did not, no, sir. But they kicked you out of the room immediately? Yes, sir. Where, where did you go? To the chapel. What did you do in the chapel? Prayed. And where was the chapel? Downstairs in the hospital. Were you praying for Maya? Yes. 
I jumped, I missed something. Were you allowed to leave the Mother Mary with her in the room there? No, sir, I was not. You weren't allowed to leave the rosary beads that would go with no, Mother Mary? And you weren't allowed to leave the prayer book? No, sir. And you went down to the chapel and prayed afterwards? Yes, sir. How long did you stay there? An hour at least. Maybe more, because other people came in and saw us in there, and they had sick children, and they asked us what we were doing, and we said we were praying, and they came in and prayed with us for their children as well. So it was a whole group of us praying for sick children. At some point before this incident at the hospital, had you given Maya a rosary or a, a medal or something like that? I've probably given them, I pass out miraculous medals, which I carry with me. Um, she about to go into a person, pull out miraculous medals. She has a rosary on her hand, and she switched hands with it like twice. She got a rosary on her hand. She's about to go into her person, pull out miraculous medals. This woman is, <laughs> if this, if it, they were faith oriented, they were faith oriented. Their faith was important to them. This goes to the level of injury, and this goes to the deprivation of, of right. And I get that the hospital, the hospital did, hospital did, and DCF did. They said they believed that mother was using religion to influence the daughter. There's a difference. There's a distinction. I'm going to try to be very careful in how I describe this. Allowing someone to pray the rosary and pray for their healing is not the same that... Oh, God. Let me draw a caveat. Lori Vallow, I'm very I'm trying to be very careful and cognizant that different faiths and religions practice and believe in different things. But there are certain things that are so beyond the pale outside of religious practices that we we recognize there's there's harm in them. We've talked about this with the Ruby Frankie case, Jody Hildebrandt, Lori Vallow. This one's tough. This one's tough because it, it's the deprivation of access. It's the institution depriving access to any aspect of the faith that I have the problem with. And I, and I, I think the jury might get there. I'm not sure the priest at the end of the day, Kind of explains it. Um, imagine being on your deathbed. This is just a hypothetical. Hypothetical. Imagine being on your deathbed and um, you believe on a, at a fundamental level that you need to receive last rites. Like, this is kind of dark to even suggest, but imagine that, that like, this is a Imagine it's a minor, a minor child who was born into a Catholic family who believes with every ounce of their soul at the age of 13, 14, 15, that they need to receive last rites. And that this minor is in end of life care. And that the hospital and perhaps the state deprives you access to receive that. And you, the child, believe that you're in end-of-life treatment or end-of-life care. Or you know that. I have a problem with that. I have a big problem with that. I don't care what faith it is. I have a big problem with that. So, this one's tough. Um, and then Deb Sappy. Just wait until, wait until, wait until, wait for a little bit. Wait for a little bit. We'll get there. You're right, but maybe because Sally Smith makes an appearance this afternoon. We'll get there. But she's about to pull out Mirax Smells. Uh, we're going to cross. Cross is pretty quick on this one. And then we'll go to jury questions before lunch. She's got a whole bag and, up. And she's a miraculous medal, and um, it has Mary on there. And it's on a chain, so you can wear it. And then there's a card um, that shows you the miraculous medal. It's a miracle that happened, and it explains, if I may, it's just real short. Okay. Um, 
It's given to. Yeah. Yeah. She's going to go. She's going to go on. So we're going to go to the cross. Um, uh, did, the attorney did that does a cross. Some sort of list of who was. The attorney that does a cross is, I think, the defense's best. This, I think, this is their. Good I think this is their best attorney. Their best Good attorney by far. Um, I just have a couple questions. For Wait, you. I missed this part. Hang on. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I love your hat. Thank you. Um, I just have a. Couple she loves the hat. For you. Um, before, uh, well, first of all, you, you, as you said, you live in the neighborhood, same neighborhood as the yes. Kowalski's friend. All right. And um, you talked about the first time you went to the house and you brought Mary, but. They were either they had company or they were leaving, so you did not stay and do the whole ritual, correct? Correct. All right. And then you had the second time when you went because Mrs. Kowalski had called you and you went there and she was very upset. Correct. Almost incoherent. I'm sorry. Almost incoherent. Abs yes. I mean, you know, she got it out, but I had to physically be there with her. Right. I understand. And it was after that visit that you and went to the hospital, correct? Correct. All right. And when you went to the hospital, you don't recall checking in with security, no ma'am, or getting a name tag, no ma'am. Right. And um, is it fair to say that you were unaware as to whether or not DCF, the Department of Children and Family Services, was requiring background checks for anybody who would be visiting Maya? Objection. People basis. That's not evidence. Overruled. Again. Yeah, That's not something you were aware of. Sure. I was not aware of any of those facts. No. Right. You had no knowledge as to what restrictions there were or were not with respect to visitors for Maya, correct? Correct. Correct. This is how you do a cross. This is how you do a cross, especially if a witness that's a likable witness. This is how you do a cross. Respectful, gentle, but direct. This is fantastic. This is phenomenal. Now, you would certainly understand that. Well, I'll start that. Um, you, when you went to the hospital room, you were only in there briefly, correct? Seconds. Seconds. Um, and you indicated that you saw Maya. She was sitting crisscross applesauce on the bed. Mm -hmm. She seemed happy to see you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, you gave her a big hug. I did. She hugged you back. Yes. Um, and then you were told that you had to leave, correct? Correct. All right. And you said that there was some dark force. You're not talking about the room was dark. You felt some sort of Yeah, it was like the energy. devil was behind me. We were the light coming in and there was the devil behind me. It's what it was. It was dark. There's it's the devil. Um, and then um, you saw Maya in the Easter of 2020. Do you recall seeing her then? That was during COVID, if I may ask the question. It's um, all those years sort of. Yes, I'm just going by your deposition testimony, like you said. Can you, you refresh my Easter? memory? Do you recall seeing do, her at Easter? Yes. Okay. And your description was that she was walking like a beautiful, thriving young teenager when you saw her, correct? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Boom. Did anyone, any of the nurses that entered the room tell you to go downstairs to get a badge? You missed the security desk or something like that? No, sir. Did any of them thought, mention to you that these DCF background checks were being done on supervisors, but not just plain visitors? No, sir. Were you there as a spy or were you there to give my hope? I was there to give my hope. Were you there as a spy? Was there or were you there to give my hope? I was there to give my hope. Uh, nice move. Nice. Ask it again. Argumentative. It was argumentative. Judge overrules basically just to get it out. And he asked the question again. Nice move, counsel. But also defense counsel. Great job. Great job getting in. Make your points. Get out. You don't have to sit around and try to diminish the person. If the jury likes them or if you think the jury likes them, don't be a bad guy. Now, the caveat, the jury has questions. The jury has questions. Nick. Members of the jury, do any of you have a question? Attorneys, please come forward. Sidebar, judge listens to it. Okay, unicorn judge, I'm, I'm done. Y'all killed me with that. He's the unicorn judge from now on. I, I can't. He's the unicorn judge. Ian, I'm redirecting to you when I'm done, bud. Um, we're not going to be too much longer. Ms. Brown? Yes. Uh, question from the jury is, did the Dark Force people say they could not pray with Maya? Yes. Any follow-up, Mr. Whitney? No, Ms. Crowells? Did the Dark Force people say that you could not pray with Maya? For those of you wondering whether the jury was uh, of the inclination this person might be a little bit kooky or wild, their mind wasn't 
based on that question, based on that question, did the Dark Force people say you couldn't pray with Maya? So one, they've already categorized them as the Dark Force people. They've 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 gone into that. Uh, that you couldn't pray with Maya. But two, the question is more along the lines of what Maya was or was not allowed to do. So, uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm, I get nervous when, when the jury is allowed to ask questions, I get, I get nervous. I, I have trouble with that because I want to be able to, to direct how the testimony is being presented. It's, it's, it's my job. So the afternoon is the witness and then we get to the fireworks and we're not going to do all of her testimony but we're going to go through let me see if i can't find it let me pull up the shed screen guys the first time i've done a recap in a while so it's taken me a little bit it's going to be a bit longer i'll try to make the next one shorter i promise you um part of it's because i'm excited i haven't done the recaps with you guys in a while since murdoch so bear with me so afternoon session, no closed captioning. I'm sorry. It is cranked up as high as I can get it. Um, let's go to our next witness. Dude, is plaintiff's counsel fighting a migraine? That looks, I've seen that look before. That's. This is the plaintiff's attorney I like. He does a good job. Now, the person who's going to do cross, uh, these two. Uh, this gentleman, the, the cursor is about, he's doing cross. He's doing direct. These two start fighting. I love it. It's fantastic. They do great. They do great. They both do great for their clients. I think Planet do Planet does better with this one, but... I do. Now you want to walk around and see if I can hear it. You may inquire. Good afternoon. Could you please state your full name for the record? It is Tashana, T A S H A W N A. And have you been called here this afternoon to testify to the psychological evaluations you did of each of the Kowalski family members, Jack, Beata, Maya, and Kyle? Yes. Before we explore your evaluations, will you please speed this up, folks. briefly describe your education as it relates to the field of psychology? I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Florida. I'm a licensed school psychologist, and I attended the University of Florida to obtain all my degrees. And what is the highest degree you have obtained? A PhD. And what was your PhD? What was the focus of study? Psychology. How long have you been practicing in the field of psychology? Um, I don't have my CV in front of me, but I believe that um, I got licensed in 2001 or two for my licensed psychology. My school psychology was the year following. And you maintain an active practice in the vicinity of Venice, Florida? My practice is located in Brighton, Florida, but um, I see a lot of individuals from this area. By this point, you've been practicing in the field of psychology for 20 plus years? Yes, approximately. And describe, if you would, your clinical practice. Uh, as part of my practice, um, I see a lot of um, children and adolescents for therapy. In addition, um, I do parent coordination and um, I complete social investigations. So um, I do a lot of evaluations of parents as well. In this instance, you were retained back in 2016 by the Kowalskis? Yes. And they ultimately paid you for those services? Yes. Do you recall approximately how much you charged for your services during that time? At that time, my rate was $250 an hour. and. Um, for the court appearances and the evaluations, um, the total fees were between seventeen and eighteen thousand dollars. I know. Um, so you were retained by the family um, to evaluate each of them. From a high level, could you describe your process in reaching these evaluations and, and opinions? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question. Do you want me to? I can break it down. Okay. Um, as part of your evaluation, did you receive medical records? I did. And did you collect 
excuse me, conduct collateral interviews. I did. Can you explain a little bit about what a collateral interview is in your field? Um, in this particular case, um, I had asked the parents to provide me um, names of individuals that I could speak with to get to know the family better. Um, for the children, teachers would be considered a collateral interview. So I spoke with um, classroom teachers, some of them, some of them I did written interviews. I had them fill out information on the parents. Why is this important? Collateral interviews. If you are the treating psychotherapist, you cannot testify about the veracity of this person's prognosis. If you're the treating therapist, you can't go outside that relationship. This is not the treating therapist. This is a therapist who's doing an evaluation. She does collateral interviews to verify whether the information she receives from the subject, Maya Kowalski, is true or not. That allows her to opine as to the cause of what's going on. Um, so that's the, that's the focus on these collateral discussions. And for those of you who missed the name, her name is Dr. Tashana Duncan. Uh, she is a uh, psychi psychologist who um, evaluated Maya during the course of the, uh, the incidents taking place. Um, you spoke with physicians that had treated Maya? I did. Um, you spoke with friends and family? I did. And you spoke with neighbors, teachers? Yes. These were all collateral interviews that were part of the evaluations? Yes. And then further, ahead of reaching your opinion for each of them, you conducted a one-on-one -on -one interview with, with the subject, whether that was Maya or Beata, Kyle, or Jack. I did, and I do not have my um, records in front of me there with me, and I can get them out if I need to. Sure. But um, I do know that I met with the parents on multiple occasions. Um, Kyle, I believe that it was one occasion, but I would need to look at the chart. Um, but Maya, I know that my evaluation was completed with her um, on one, at one occasion because it was at the courthouse at the time I met with her to do it. All right. Your Honor, trial exhibit 2006 has already been admitted to evidence that we published with the jury. Uh, you may. All right. This is your psychological evaluation for Maya Kowalski, is it not? It is. And just looking at the header, um, the subject was Maya Kowalski, and it says contact date, January 6, 2017. Is that the meeting or the evaluation you conducted at the courthouse that you previously mentioned? It we'll is. go to 1.25 because she talks faster than the other witness. 2017. It was. And by that point, Maya was 11. She turned 10 and had a 10th birthday in the hospital, right? Correct. All right. If we'll look down towards the bottom of the page, you list all of the medical records and documents that you reviewed. For example, the fourth one down, you reviewed the records from Dr. Wassenaar, who the jury heard from this morning. Um, I was not aware the jury heard from this morning, but I, was, um, I did review records from his office. Some were provided to me and some I requested, um, my office requested directly from him. All right, turning to the next page, you reviewed and received the neuropsychological evaluation of Maya Kowalski dated October 20th, 2016. This is the third entry on the page. Yes, and I believe that was completed by Dr. Lewis, I believe. Dr. James Lewis? Um, I believe that was his first name. I don't have it in front of me, but it sounds right. familiar. Uh, you also reviewed psychiatry and psychology notes from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, did you not? If, I, I did. And if we look down approximately eight or nine down, you see a psychiatry consult signed by Mark Cavett, MD. Uh, do you know Mark Cavett to be a psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital? Yes, he's been there many years. You also reviewed... Uh, approximately 20 entries down Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital's records for the period October 7th through November 10th, 2016. And then importantly, three from the bottom, you in, you reviewed all of the inpatient psychiatry, psychology, and physiatry notes from Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. I did. It's listed. All right. Turning to page four, and, and that, that list continues through page three, now to page four. You reviewed, uh, among the items you reviewed were a photo of Mike Kowalski at Tampa's Lowry Park Zoo. You see that? Yes. I, I actually recall that picture. All right. If we could publish for the jury 2530-045 previously admitted into evidence. You may. And this photograph, do you see the date? Um, it is dated June 21st, 2016. And so this would have been approximately two and a half months before her admission in October to Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital. Yes, if that's state correct. It's it looks correct. like, uh, Mr. Whitney, can you hold on one second? Let me try to cycle the uh, presentation system. Yes, sir. While they're doing that, we're going to fast forward to the next part of relevant testimony. Uh, do, 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 4319. 4319. Was reporting experiencing um, significant pain, and that's why um, if you look at the psychological progress notes for the therapy, she focused Wait, a lot on cognitive too, behavior. Too much. Hang on. 
40. Um, after she had seen her eight or nine occasions and the date that I spoke with her, the notes, you know, I have from her, what she reported to me verbally matched the medical records that she provided me. Um, and it, at that point, um, again, she didn't mention a specific diagnosis, but um, she was concerned about her um, mental health and she was concerned about the child expressing that she was stressed and feeling isolated because she was not able to see and spend time with the people that she wanted to. All right, if we could turn for a second to 10,001-3817. So it's another progress note from Jennifer Katzenstein dated October 19th, 2016, so about a week later. And if you'll uh, highlight the interval history, all, all the following, the three paragraphs there. And in the first paragraph, I want to focus on um, Maya was relating in the middle of the paragraph to Dr. Katzenstein that the physical therapy, especially the physical therapy at TGH, was the worst thing for her RSD. Did, did Maya explain that to you? Um, she did not speak of um, TGH a whole lot with me. Um, she spoke more of um, the therapy at, at John Hopkins All Children Hospital. And she also discussed here hyperbaric oxygen therapy and Maya's thoughts that it is. Crazy Cat Queen, very, very, very kind of you. Thank you very, very much. I will look at these before tomorrow's recap if I do, if and when I do one. Crazy Cat Queen says, Rob, I sent you the Hopkins patients' rights via Twitter messages. Numbers 2, 5, 8, 9, 10, 19, 21, 23 on the first page, even if she had the conver or had conversion slash facetious disorder, Hopkins messed up. I'm going to look at those. Um, I want to read them before I make a comment on them, but I would be surprised if they're not designated exhibits. So um, let's continue going because right now we're talking about Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Katzenstein, who's the, this is the doctor who is essentially um, tasked with the psychiatric care of Maya while she's admitted. And right now you have the evaluator who's making a comment about those recommendations and whether they were or were not followed. It have been helpful. Yes. And then second to last paragraph there, when asked to define her pain, Maya stated that she has pain all over and it is really bad. Um, subjective reports of pain, how do you treat those in your practice? If a patient reports pain to you, especially a, a pediatric patient, a child, do you take that at face value or how do you account for that? Objection to the foundation of the witness's treating the statements as out of hand. Or I believe one of the reasons that Dr. Kassenstein was um, employing cognitive behavioral therapy is um, because Maya did believe she was, whether she was experiencing her perception is her reality, that she was reporting experiencing um, significant pain. And that's why um, if you look at the psychological progress notes for the therapy, she focused a lot on cognitive behavioral therapy. She used some patient education and she used some biofeedback based on her notes. There you go. Right there. Boom. There you go. So if it's conversion, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, that's how you're directing it. That's what you're doing. You're doing CBT to try and surmise what the cause of the pain that's manifesting in the psychosis in the, in the, in the brain. Um, sorry, factitious disorder, conversion factitious, but same thing. Um, CBT is the way you address that. So right now you have two prognoses that are being presented. CRPS, conversion. Conversion, CBT. CRPS, pain management. In the last sentence there of that second to last paragraph, she described her parents as her main form of coping and that she stated she would eat more if they were here. She asked me if she could send her parents a letter, which I deferred to the medical team. Did, in your conversations with Dr. Katzenstein, did she ever explain to you why she needed to consult with the medical team before allowing Maya to communicate with her parents? Here you um, go. The topic never came up. All right, we can turn back now to the report of Maya Kowalski, Exhibit 2006, and we're back at page eight. And the last paragraph there begins, Maya repeatedly expressed significant frustration over professionals not believing that she was physically ill and in constant pain. Well. Dr. Katzenstein believed she was in pain, but apparently some of the other professionals did not. Objection, Your Honor. I was aware that I also mischaracterization of the It was a proper, it was a proper objection. It was argumentative as hell, but 
you can tell these attorneys, they're already spicy with one another. I don't know if I can recall it perfectly, but I'll, I'll just re-ask it. Um, this statement, Maya repeatedly expressed significant frustration over professionals not believing that she was physically ill and inconsequent. Was that a reference to the professionals at Johns Hopkins Ultra Risk Hospital? It was when she, she spoke with me. All right. Moving down in the middle of the paragraph, she expressed frustration over physical and occupational therapy at JHATS. She stated that they were the worst. She stated the therapy has exhausted her and her pain is worse after participation in them. Any further detail that you recall? Um, that's generally a summary of what she shared with me. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, that's one of the things Dr. Katzenstein was trying to work with her when she does brief meetings she had with her is compliance to get her to comply to, with some of the therapies. In fact, they put um, they initiated like a, a behavior chart with some incentives in place to try to get um, Maya to, to be motivated to, to do those, even though they were uncomfortable for her. All right. Turning to page nine, first paragraph, she conveyed, that's Maya, she conveyed that she liked the therapist, Rebecca Johnson. She was seen prior to her admission to J-Hatch. Rebecca Johnson, from your knowledge, is with Eagle Wings? She is. That's the individual. I could not recall her name. Um, and I will say that I know when she first started working with Maya, she worked with Lauren Mock. I think she was finishing um, up her licensure requirements. But I do know um, it, it, at the time, like in December, she was fully licensed because there was some discussion or in January um, about her continuing to be able to see her because one of the current concerns was making some, sure somebody was qualified given some of the concerns about diagnosis. Do you recall in review of the records of, of Eagle Wings and Rebecca Johnson, the frequency with which Maya was attending therapy? Based on the reports um, of obtained from um, Eagle's Wings and also the family and Maya, she was seeing her uh, on a consistent basis, like weekly. And that would be more appropriate than three or four hours over three and a half months? Based on what I know about this child, I was um, shocked when I learned the um, little psychotherapy she was giving, particularly since um, a lot of people were attributing her issues to psychological issues rather than medical and maybe psychological. Let me explain, because we might have passed over it. Throughout all of the submission process, it is then discovered that while these are the concerns they have, that it's either one of two things, right? You have CRPS or you have um, fictitious slash uh, conversion. That requires CBT therapy. You have to go into the mind of the patient and try to deconstruct where the pain's coming from. CRPS, physical, that's the physical treatment. They had both of these on the table. A lot of people were saying, we don't think it's physical. We don't think it's physical. We don't think it's physical. Three hours, three hours of cognitive behavioral therapy, three hours of actual psychological therapy, psychotherapy, three. Three. Now, defense counsel takes issue with this. And that opens a door that I don't think he wanted open. So the next paragraph from what's highlighted, let me read this up. The examiner did some follow-up questions regarding statements Maya had made to Dr. Lewis. Upon explaining that this examiner had some follow-up questions, Maya spontaneously offered she did not care for Dr. Lewis because he had misconstrued things she had said. Upon further query, Maya conveyed that she had came to the conclusion because she heard him speaking with a nurse regarding their conversation at the end of the meetings with him. Well, that's a problem. She indicated that she had told Dr. Lewis that she had memory and blurred vision problems in the past, but denied currently experiencing these difficulties. She indicated these difficulties were related to CRPS. Moreover, she indicated that the doctor in Mexico had a candid conversation with her, with her Muslim mother present regarding the risk of death. We've bypassed that. That That's going to come back. Uh, it's not really the focus of where we are today. Because they're going to focus on the, the ketamine coma and the risk of death in that and, and what was involved in that. Um, I'll explain that when we get to the doctor from Mexico who's going to testify. That's the more appropriate place. This right now is focused on the therapy. And it looked like one, it looks like on the third paragraph, one of your exercises was a um, sentence completion exercise. Would you explain uh, the usefulness of this in a psychological evaluation? Sure. Um, I, often, when, and you can do this with adults, I tend to use it more with adolescents and children. It's considered a subjective um, psychological measure, which means that you can't derive a score for it. Um, I like to tell individuals 
that um, it often you look for themes and to see if they're consistent with things, maybe the child or the adolescent could be an adult if you administer to an adult or sharing with you um, or maybe information that you're getting in other records. And so what happens is I start a sentence and the child completes it. Um, and it can be given one of two ways. Maya was is very bright. Um, so I could have had her fill it out. What I ended up doing is reading it to her and filling it out. Just part of it had to do with the time because we were limited in the courtroom. Um, it's not a measure that you follow up and say to the child, why did you answer that way? Again, it's more about looking for things that um, are consistent with maybe the information in the clinical interview or from other people that may have concerns about the child. All right, if we could highlight the prompts and the responses here that were conducted, it's the italicized text there. So you, you would prompt her, for example, you would say, most of all I want, and then Maya would respond? Yes, she'd say to go home. All right, and you would prompt her, uh, turning the second to last line, my mother won't. Um, second line here. Second to last line. Oh, second to last, um, let's see. So, Here's, oh, my mother won't. Like I said, my mother won't, and she responded, hurt me. All right, and then the last one, mother and I. Uh, that would have been the prompt, and she responded, we like swimming, shopping, and hanging. Swimming, shopping, hanging out. <laughs> We like everything. Sorry, that wasn't highlighted. That was part of it. <laughs> Next page is page 10 of your report. Now, uh, if you can just back up for page nine for a second, this is a continue. Page 10 is continuation of the bottom there, which is an interview with Rebecca Johnson. That's the counselor at Eagles Wings, right? All right. This is going to seem like a big, fast skip, but we're going to skip. We're going to skip all the way to the beginning of cross examination. And we're going to watch a bunch of this and I'm going to turn it back up to one and a half speed because we do need to get through quite a bit of it. But um, the tactic that the attorney takes in cross, it's a tactic. I think he should have recalibrated, uh, but let's go ahead and see where this gets him because it opens the door for some very, very, very contentious arguments. 145. 46, boom, 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 go. No further questions at this time. Mr. Shapiro. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, you were hired by the attorneys for the Kowalskis, correct? That is true, I was referred by them. The Kowalskis signed my engagement letter and paid me. You're absolutely right, that was referred and it's in my consent. Right, and just so there's no dispute about this, you were not an independent court-appointed psychologist. Instead, you were retained by the Kowalskis, paid by the Kowalskis for your work. That is true, it was not a court-appointed neutral. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, the reason why you were involved was because there was a dependency action going on with DCF in the state of Florida, and one of the questions they needed to visit with you was about visitation. Is that true? Um, I, it's been a long time, but I know that when I, and I, you know, I had limited documentation providing me about the tendency action, uh, but my understanding is that there were some concerns about the parents and that there were psychological evaluations that wider being requested and they agreed to. I did not see a court order for them. There may have been, um, but that I was going to evaluate the parents and it was as part of the dependency. Okay, and just, I'll, I'll show you those records next, but just to be clear, in fairness, um, you're not a medical doctor, true? No, I said that more than once. <laughs> okay, I won't belabor it, I promise you. No, it's true, I'm not. Okay, you're not. Uh, not to spoil it, but he, he belabors it and it loses steam real quick. I'm here to tell this jury whether Maya has CRPS or not based on your diagnosis. That is absolutely true. Okay. Um, you, you have, since your, your evaluations of Maya, I believe, were in December and January 2017. Um, I'm 20, sorry. sorry. You visited with Maya in um, December of 2016 at All Children's. I believe it was before December okay. that I met with her as a collateral because it was early on in the process. Okay. I would, I could go back and look at the notes, but it had to probably be, I would say, in probably early November that I went up there just to meet with her. At that point, um, I had been previously testified when they inquired about her. I was using her as a collateral. I didn't do any type of assessment, you know, in that meeting with her. It was the evaluation was later. After you completed your evaluation of Maya and completed your report, you continued to work with Mr. Anderson's office on this case, true? I um, I believe around 2020, I participated. I could give it a date. It was around three or four years ago. Um, they asked me to participate in a call, which I did. I know both attorneys' offices and um, have requested some information from me, records. 
um, and then just prior to this trial, um, I was opposed, um, I believe, by all children's. Um, and then today, I was subpoenaed by them, and everybody compensated me for my time. So let me ask you just a couple of questions about sure. your report, um, which is, in, uh, Clay, if you'll put it up, it's Joint Exhibit 20, 2006, and I'll go to page 11. And it's going to be the uh, under summary and recommendations, a second paragraph. I think it's the third sentence that starts with the Department of Children and Families. Yes. And th these are your words, correct? You guys see what he's doing? You see what he's doing? Um, DCF. Here we go. DCF. 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 There we go. So trying to uh, muddy the water. Now, he's going to make a lot of comment about DCF and try to intervene. Now, plaintiff's counsel is sitting back because they want Sally Smith. They want Sally Smith. He's not objecting. I was wondering why the heck he didn't object right there, but he didn't. I want to see where it goes. Are you ready here? Yes, this is our board. And you wrote that, quote, the Department of Children and Families intervened and cut off Maya's contact with her parents, siblings, treating doctors, therapists, priests, and friends. That's what you found, correct? That was my understanding. No. Okay. Your understanding was it was the Department of Families intervention that cut off that communication, correct? That was my understanding. Let me ask Repeat you it. Good. Um, some of the records that you reviewed. <clears throat> well, let me back up for a minute. Um, you understood that all children could not discharge Maya without a court order, correct? Objection. Objection. Legal basis is beyond the scope and it's delving into issues that subject to order on that. Overall on that question. I, I don't recall the specifics, but I do know because I wasn't at all the dependency hearings. I tested a few a few times and I know um, that there were attorneys from all children's as well as the dependency attorneys, the family had different attorneys, and the Department of Children and Families had several. Um, and I know at some point I do recall there was um, this issue of not being able to discharge. I didn't really follow it all, but I do recall something about being issue with that. <laughs> Now we're in the swamp. Now we're in the swamp. We are we are now here. We are in the swamp. We are in the place where medical meets parents' rights, meets court order, meets doctors, meets third-party consultants, meets hired consultants, meets doctors serving roles for DCF, the hospital, and other hospitals. We are now in this swamp. Who's responsible for what? That's where we are. That's where the defense wants it. It's the plaintiff's job to now give us signposts and tell us who was responsible for what. Let me, let me go back to your report since we have it on the screen. And I'll probably jump around. That's okay. That's okay. So let me ask you about the last uh, sentence that you wrote. It says, no less than three medical doctors have diagnosed her medical condition, and no less than three mental health professionals have evaluated my None of whom have confirmed a diagnosis of factitious disorder. Those were your words? Yes. The three doctors you spoke to were Dr. Kirkpatrick, Dr. Hanna, and Dr. Chilton, correct? I did not speak to Dr. Chilton. I testified that I reviewed his report, and then I reviewed um, a neurology report. Um, I think I referenced her. I can't remember. I think it was Dr. R, maybe, um, that diagnosed her with CRPS as well. You also, God help me if I ever have to cross this woman. Like, cross-examining this witness is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No matter how simple, no matter how simple the question, she is good. She is good um, at giving her answer to her question, not your question. Uh, and then this answer, Sarah Waters. Oh, sorry. Um, I don't know who Sally is. We'll get there. And the door is being, listen to the door being cracked open here. After the shiny wheel of death. Come on. Your, your Come on. statement, though, about who diagnosed Maya with CRPS was based on those three, correct? Yes. You did have records from a physician that had diagnosed factitious disorder. Did you know that? Um, I believe recalling that, um, I do recall maybe early on seeing um, some of that. Okay, because you didn't put in your report to the court or who would read this that there were physicians who diagnosed factitious disorder, did you? I, I recall specifically reviewing the records that there were um, some rule outs in one of the physicians. I don't know if I recall specifically the diagnosis, but I know that the thing that I kept testifying to in the hearings is, is I think they need to figure out, I was being told to shot a medical issue and they need to figure out what she did or not in order to find the appropriate diagnosis because as a psychologist, 
um, economic certain diagnoses if there is a medical condition that's causing the symptomology. I hope you guys hear what she just said. Really, I really do hope you say that. I hope you hear it because this is very, very, very important in this case. This psychologist is unable to really treat and diagnose because you have to determine whether there's a medical cause for the pain symptoms. You have to get to the brain. You have to get to the brain. You have to eliminate the body and get to the brain before you can start a clear line of treatment on the brain. So she's begging for people to give, give her the diagnosis that gets rid of the body as the cause. Get rid of the medical. Get me to the brain. Clay, if you'll put up Defense Exhibit 3047 10. Is this an evidence? Yeah. The Attorney General records? That's how that works. Oh, okay. Let's not put it up. It's not an evidence. I apologize. I thought this was part of the ruling. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you about um, what you did review and what is an evidence. Um, one of the reports that you did review was that of Dr. Lewis. I don't know that. Yes, she is a doctor. Okay. Um, and that was one of the reports that you had to review and comment on when you did your evaluation of mine. Is that right? I, um, I did review it. In fact, one of the things he specifically requested in that evaluation was the person evaluating the mother had that evaluation. Um, this is an evidence, Your Honor, Joint Exhibit 1046. Clay, if you could put that up here, uh, you can go to page 7, please. Um, and just for the purpose of background for this jury, Dr. Lewis performed his psychi psychological evaluation of Maya while she was at Old Children's Hospital. True. And the door is now kicked open. Doors kicked open. We're going to fast forward to the spicy parts. Let me see if I can't get us there without like boring you guys with tons and tons and tons. Uh, what you heard was the sound of the door being kicked open because while well, this was diagnosis at the hospital, no conversation about Sally Smith and the open. Did you guys hear Sally Smith come up and direct? I didn't because it didn't. It didn't come up at all. It didn't come up because the hospital doesn't want to go anywhere near her because Dr. Sally Smith is a complicated factor. Let me see. Get me to redirect. Come on, Rob. We can do this. Give me one sec. Um, Okay, we're going to go to 219. Because so I think that'll get us there. Any records requests other than what was made in my office? <laughs> so have you ever seen the notes or a recording oh, of the nope. interview? A little fast. Hang on. The voluminous amount of records. And I testified earlier about the. I. To transfer to the Moors, were you aware nope. of that? Come on. Night transportation. Sorry, I'll explain. Give me one second. Let me find out where I need to be in my video. Uh, the explanation is basically this. Dr. Sally Smith served several functions. She was a coordinator for DCF, but she was also employed directly on staff for the hospital. She was the one that made a lot of the directions. She was the one that said to do a lot of the things. She was the one that said to basically deprive and deny and do all of this stuff. She was orchestrating a lot of this. And the question becomes, in what capacity was she doing this? Was she doing this as a agent for DCF, Department of Children and Families, or was she doing this as an agent for the hospital? Because they both played a role. The hospital wanted to avoid this because they don't want her name coming up at all. And if they can use the acronym DCF and not have her name come in, then they'll never associate with the hospital. But all of the focus on Dr. Lewis and how Dr. Lewis did everything right and Dr. Lewis wasn't referred, um, it was the focus on Dr. Lewis because Dr. Lewis was tasked with this by Dr. Sally Smith. When they were, I know that placement was explored, mm -hmm. but it's my understanding about all, but I didn't know about them. Tra transitioning a bit, um, you did go to all children to visit with Maya the first time, right? Yeah. Nope. Got a fast forward. Come on. Give me a redirect. Stop spinning. Come on, guys. I. 
154 in. I need to get to the end of the stream because I need to be able to do this. Right. That's not unique. Come on. Behave, behave, behave. Quick process. Okay. When you first went to All Children's, I believe from, uh, well, let me ask you, Kathy Betty greeted you and brought you to Maya. I don't recall if she greeted me, but I think I testified earlier that I believe she is the one I spoke to that go to my notes, but they, you know, made arrangements me for me, you know, um, like I didn't have any difficulty finding her or anything like that. The, and that was my question. Yeah. The process from when you went to all children to meet with Maya, it was smooth, right? I, I had no issues in going up there, checking in. They helped me find the rec room. They offered to try to find me a room because it was a Saturday. A lot of stuff was closed down. And that's when I said, I think this will be, you know, fine. Maya was fine. And I testified earlier about the corridor, you know, there weren't people around. Um, and I stayed about an hour, um, and I let them know when I was leaving. I, you know, walked her back to the rec room. Okay. You then saw Maya at two fourteen forty three. Hang on. On January sixth, correct? That date sounds correct. I'll report in front of me. But yeah. oh, we'll let this play out. Maya was at the courthouse. It, it was. Okay. Um, during either interview with Maya, and just for the sake of speeding up, either meeting her at All Children's or evaluating her at the courthouse. Did Maya ever complain to you about physical abuse? She never. She wasn't allowed to meet with her at the hospital because she didn't have staff privileges. You have to apply to get them. It's a lot of bureaucracy you have to go through. You have to put them through the insurance company to get staff privileges. It's a bunch of bullshit, to be honest. They wouldn't allow her to conduct the evaluation there because if they conducted the evaluation, if she was allowed to conduct the evaluation in the hospital, then the hospital is worried about taking on liability for what she's doing there. It's bullshit. It doesn't make sense. She's a third party. It's a technicality. But she was frustrated that she couldn't meet with Maya in the hospital. So at one of the dependency hearings, she goes, Judge, I haven't been able to meet with her. She goes, Judge, I haven't been able to meet with her at all. And the judge says, that's ridiculous. And the judge says, we're going to go ahead and make time to make this happen. So at the courthouse, the judge says, we're going to open a room. You can meet with her there. So defense counsel is barking up a tree that it just... It's not a tree I want to be barking up. Because then it gets to the question of why did you have to meet at the courthouse? Why weren't you meeting at the hospital? And then also, you didn't meet the hospital? Well, that's interesting. That means that everything that happened in the hospital, you didn't see. So, uh, so we are going to fast forward to, well, we have a few more minutes, but then 2.15 um, is where it Use the word physical redirect. abuse or suggest it anything to me of that nature. I would have been, I'm a mandatory reporter, which every day is important. I would have had to call the abuse hotline and I would have notified everybody. I know you don't have to, but that's my policy. Okay. <laughs> if you had, because you're a mandatory reporter, if you had even a reasonable suspicion of some type of abuse of my occurring at all children's, yes, you would have brought that to the attention of all children's and called the abuse hotline. Yeah, I, I would have told all the parties involved because I want them to know I'm, you know, that I'm the one that you know, had to make the report. <laughs> okay. So just to be clear, during both interviews with Maya, she never told you that she had ever been touched inappropriately. Correct? No, I believe I was asked that in the deposition as well. Right. And and the reason I'm going through it with you again is I can't just play your deposition. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'm going through it with you again. She, Maya never complained to you about being held against her will in a darkened room, correct? No, I, I never had those conversations. And I reviewed some stuff after the fact, I think, position or maybe... But I was never presenting any information during the course of my work for the family. Maya never complained to you about being held in some type of semi-nude photos or anything of that nature, did she? No, not to me directly. It would have been included in my report. Maya never See, that's you honest. That, that gives her that rights, gives credibility. Uh, her religious rights were being violated. Did, did she? she did not use that term. I will say that um, during the collateral interview, she said so she expressed frustration because people, her, you know, people from her congregation were not permitted. It, it was her understanding that she see her and that she couldn't see her priest privately. And um, so when she told me about her attorney and I went back and contacted her attorney because she had an attorney. <laughs> oh, she, Michael, you know, I disagree. She had Wait for redirect. But just to be very clear for this jury while we're here, during your two interviews with Maya, she never told you anything that made you, ex to, that made you suspicious for either abuse or neglect at all children. Not that she was, not that it would be reportable under, you know, the statutory definition of abuse or neglect. Okay. Let me just ask you a couple more questions. Um, about your reporting. <clears throat> All right. So she's inherently more honest because she's basically, well, inherently appears more honest because she literally is saying this... things like, no, I didn't report it. I didn't think there was abuse. She's, she's not, she's not coming out 100% in favor of Maya. 
She's not saying everything that was said was there, blah, blah, blah. She's, like I said, I would hate to cross her. Like, I, it would be tough because she also takes the question away from you. She's great at explanations. She's a good witness. She's a good witness. Um, being late because it's it's a two hour stream. It's nine o'clock where I am, and I'm a full time attorney. I need to actually do work tomorrow, and I need to be able to function to do that. So I'm trying to make sure I'm hitting the high points and the the relevant topics that were discussed today, but do it in a timely fashion. Admission at Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital. That now we're on redirect. Have diagnosed and chosen by proxy was Dr. Sally Smith. I don't recall first question anyone else making that diagnosis. Um, Hold up. We're going to, we're going to rewind because I want, I want, I want you to hear how fast he gets up and asks this question. I appreciate your time today. I don't have any more questions for you. Thank you. Mr. Whitney. Yes, thank you. Were you aware that the only person in this admission at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital that claimed to have diagnosed with just by proxy was Dr. Sally Smith? Boom. I don't recall seeing anyone else making that diagnosis. Um, First question. Other than Sally Smith. And you're aware that she's a rotation director for the residency program at Johns Hopkins Children's Hospital? Oh, yeah. Yep. That's what I said. The, the defense counsel stepped into it. I told you the defense counsel stepped into it because he brought she brought up Dr. Lewis or uh, Dr. Dr. Lewis, yeah, Dr. Lewis, and, the, and everything there and everything else. And defense counsel harped on no one else making it, no one else making it, no one else making it. And the defense counsel also in the cross was going through how it was 60 plus hours of uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy. Isn't that therapy? Isn't that therapy? Isn't that therapy? Yes, 60 plus hours of physical therapy, occupational therapy. That's important. But you had her explaining that this child, when you're diagnosing that before you can get to psychological treatment i need you to diagnose away the the medical like get get a neuropsych in there to do an evaluation diagnose diagnose away the medical so i can start treating cbt and why are you not treating cbt so 60 plus hours 60 plus hours of physical therapy that she hates cuz it hurts the hell out of her occupational therapy that she hates cuz it hurts the hell out of her and 3 hours total of psychological therapy. And Dr. Lewis, Dr. Lewis, all these other doctors, plaintiff's counsel must have been jumping in his boots because the first question, second question, and now defense counsel is going, oh, shit. Sidebar. Now we're going to argue. Well, you open the door. Let's watch them yell at each other. This is great. Well, come on. Internet, man. Yes, they treat the physical pain before the psychological. You're right. The therapist was sitting there going, yes, physical therapy is recommended. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. You have to to at least do the eval if you're telling if you are the hospital and you are saying that the basis of your conclusion is that she's making this up if you are saying that to everybody in the world you better be doing the the mental stuff today the objection is overruled so sally smith is the rotation director for the residency objection overruled uh you open the program at johns hopkins also in hospital I do not recall being um, aware of that specific appointment, but I know that um, she had some affiliation with them. And you're aware that she had staff privileges at the hospital? That was my understanding when I said affiliation. And you're aware that she serves on multiple executive committees at the hospital? Yo, oh, okay. You want to know how excited he was about this? Listen to how fast questions are coming. I'm going to sustain the leading. Are you aware that Dr. Sally Smith serves on multiple executive committees at the hospital? I do not know if I'm aware of that, but again, I knew that she did some work at the hospital and that she had privileges. Are you, so there was a lot of discussion about Dr. Lewis and him coming in to evaluate Maya at the hospital. Are you aware that the hospital was directed to conduct a neuropsychological evaluation? 
I do not recall specifically that the hospital was directed. I knew that I got his evaluation because Dr. Dr. Kastenstein's a neuropsychologist as well. Are, are you aware that Dr. Alex Smith handpicked Dr. Lewis to come and do the neuropsychological evaluation? Boom. Boom. Doesn't matter. Jerry heard it. Doesn't matter. Are Jerry heard it. Dr. Lewis was selected to perform a neuropsychological evaluation at the hospital. I, I recall reading in some of the information, I believe it may have been in his report um, in front of me, that um, the referral, like Dr. Smith made a referral. Right. I am aware of that. And so several statements were put on the screen about what Maya allegedly said to Dr. Lewis. Are you aware that Maya disputes Dr. Lewis's reporting? She disputed some of that specific reporting to me, so I'm aware of some of that. And earlier you testified, I think on my questions, that, and perhaps on counsel's questions, that you, subject to request from the hospital, provided your raw testing data and the oh. totality of your file. Hold up. This is one of my favorite parts. Oh, this is great. This is great. This is, this is, this is, this is the case. This is today. This was today. I thought plaintiff's case was toast. I thought it was having difficulty until this attorney got up on redirect and just started driving home the nails. Oh, this is great. Uh, for these psychological evaluations, did you not? It was for Maya's, I believe. All the raw testing, I believe they had a hearing in. Um, all right, so Dr. Lewis makes these statements, which my disputes. Are you aware that when a request was made to Dr. Lewis for his raw testing data and notes, he claimed to have lost them? I'm Doesn't matter, Jerry heard it. I'm not aware of any record request than what was made in my office. <laughs> so have you ever seen the notes or a recording of the interview or raw testing data from Dr. Lewis? I've only seen his written product, the report. And during this interview, we've established Maya was on multiple medications from the hospital. Oh my oh, God, it's, bad. it's better, it's better, it's the, better. The records that she taken medication the day before. All right. Now, with regards to four hours of cognitive behavioral therapy, your comments oh. during my questions were limited to the limited cognitive behavioral therapy that the hospital provided during that three and a half month span, right? Yes. And that's what led you to characterize the hospitalization as warehousing this girl. Yes, and the fact. Oh, I have to use warehousing again. Oh my God, this guy. This is why I love this because defense attorney got up and he was like, I'm going to go ahead and shut the book on this case. And plaintiff's attorney was like, nah, not having it, bro. And then got up and asked these questions. And my word was he throwing smoke. This is how you do a redirect. Wow. And just, just, oh. This was great. And the term he used was warehousing, that they weren't treating this child. They were warehousing this child. And that term gets repeated at least six times for the jury to hear over and over and over again. This was a phenomenal redirect. This was a phenomenal redirect because I thought defense counsel did a good job poking some holes. And I was going, why is no one objecting? And then dude comes in and just starts laying bombs. And it's just awesome. But my understanding is, is that Dr. Lewis recommended the um, neurological consult and throughout the entire process, everybody said a neurologist would be the one to rule out the diagnosis or confirm mm -hmm. um, that the medical doctors were telling me I'm not qualified to do that. And the information provided me is that that never story, not treated. And, and so you were confronted a minute ago with a bunch of physical therapy and occupational therapy records. You never express any opinion on the adequacy of occupational therapy or physical therapy at the hospital, did you? No. Oh, here we go. And, the and everything they presented to you, did they confront you in any way with any additional cognitive behavioral therapy record to dispute the four-hour figure that you tallied? Um, no, I, like I just said, the information I have is, was a duplicate of what I'd previously gotten that y'all provided me regarding the psychological and um, psychiatry notes. The problem that you were pointing out, if I understood you correctly, was that they were alleging that Maya had a psychological disorder. Meanwhile, they provided four hours of psychological therapy over three and a half months. Thank you, leading, but doesn't matter. Jerry heard it. What is the problem with alleging that well, a continual Johnny. girl has a psychological disorder, but not providing therapy, if there is a problem with that? Well, I, I think at a minimum, even though I didn't evaluate Maya early on, at a minimum, she was on a psychotherapy regimen of getting it weekly. So I would have expected them at least to start with that. And then if she made significant improvements, they might you know, titrate the therapy, you know, go to both bi-weekly or less frequently. And I think that even whether her issues were psychological exclusively, as some people were taking the position of, or whether it was a medical problem and there were some psychological problems interrelated, secondary, I think certainly 
um, the professionals that worked with her in the mental health field, Dr. Katzstein was even seeing the child was very distressed for a lot of the circumstances. And, and I think that there was a lot of um, documentation where, you know, I didn't do the PT, that she got PT because they would go to get psychotherapy and she would be gone, but then there was no makeup session in the hospital. Oh my right. God. Last Did you guys, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. So they prioritize PT over psychotherapy. There's the PT going on, but not the psychotherapy. This witness is gold for the plaintiffs, but she doesn't, she doesn't feel like she's stretching. She doesn't feel like she's trying to give the right. She's just saying what she saw. Like this is a phenomenal witness. And honestly, Plaintiff's counsel at this point doesn't care what she's saying because he's waiting for his next question because the questions are the questions are what's important because every question's like, oh, here's another shot across the bow. Here's another shot across the bow. There was discussion about this, these um, attempts to transfer Maya Kowalski to the Moors. Are you aware of the transfer diagnosis that the hospital actually tried to to transfer her under to the Moors? I, I think I just said earlier. I don't recall the specifics of it. It's been a long time. I just knew that there was some dispute on whether it was going to be an appropriate placement based on. Um, I think that there were some concerns about the parents had on whether they could do medical. Uh, it wasn't clear to me. I just knew the child never got moved. It wasn't clear to me all the dynamics um, between all children's maybe the dependency action in the parents. I wasn't privy to all that. And so you weren't aware that Johns Hopkins, Al Jones Hospital was trying to That's force a transfer. I object to the foundation. He's so upset. He's so bad. He's so bad. Were you aware of Beata Kowalski's sensitivity to having Maya Kowalski diagnosed with a psychiatric or psychological disorder? I was aware from my work with Beata, um, that she was concerned that the medical issues, that she had a real medical problem that was being dismissed and labeled strictly psychological. I did not get the impression in my evaluation of her that she was against any type of um, therapy or intervention. In fact, her therapist reported to me, and it was in the notes, that they could, her and uh, Maya's dad <laughs> consistently brought Maya to therapy sessions for therapy <laughs> after having the, you know, the illness diagnosed. Um, All right, so we know that Dr. Katzenstein believed that this child had a physical condition, right? So she told me. All right. Assume for the purposes of this question that Johns Hopkins Altshuler's Hospital is trying to transfer Maya Kowalski, not with a physical diagnosis, but with a psychiatric diagnosis. Knowing what you know about Beata Kowalski, would it make sense for her to resist those efforts? Objection to this definition. Sustained. Are you aware of a phone call that was recorded regarding this dispute over the discharge diagnosis? It's in the Morris. Um, I don't believe that I ever listened to any phone call or was provided information on that. The attorney doesn't care at this point. He doesn't care. He's asking questions because it's not for the witness. He's asking questions to tip the jury off and say, hey, you're going to hear a phone call. Hey, you're going to see records. Hey, you're going to see this. I don't care that this witness remembers it, but they decided they wanted to go down this road. road. I'm going to go ahead and preview what we've got coming. This attorney might have turned their case around. I thought that this redirect was so damn impressive. Well, how impressive was it, Rob? Well, let me answer that question. So you usually go direct, cross, redirect. And that's usually the end of it. Some weird cases out there will go direct, cross, redirect, recross, redirect, but most of them don't. This case has not been that way. There has not been recrossed. There has not been redirect. This judge has been very confined to what is done. When this witness, or when this, um, when this attorney finishes redirect, defense counsel pops out of his chair, and I mean jumps out of his chair, and goes brief recross. Like tells the judge, doesn't wait for the judge to invite him. Tells the judge brief recross. He goes at it with recross, and then. The plaintiff's attorney at the end of the recross jumps up and says, Your Honor, just one second, and goes with re-redirect. It was watching those two spar today. That was my fun part. That was the part of this case that made it important because this is trial work. This is how trials run. You play 4D chess. You play 4D chess and you fight. And you're doing the best you can for your client. 
And damn it, that plaintiff's attorney, there was parts of that cross where he was getting mopped. But then one, one line of questioning that he was waiting for, that he didn't know if they were going to ask, and he's hoping they do. And they do ask that line of questioning and the focus on Dr. Lewis. One line of questioning, and he's out of his chair like a rocket. And he does his job. And he makes the connection that the hospital didn't want him to make. It was, it was phenomenal trial work. The last three hours of this hearing today was great. It was great. Um, respectfully to the other attorneys that are there, like the, the, the lady on defense side who does the, uh, uh, the cross examination so far, she's my favorite on the defense. On the plaintiff's team, it's this guy because he came in like a spitfire and he threw jabs. And I really appreciated how important he took each one of those questions and how he took the opportunity to tell the jury, by the way, don't let them try to trick you with these questions that she doesn't have an answer for. I've got questions that she can't answer too, but they're answers that you're going to want to hear that I'm going to present to you later in the form of evidence. So that was, that was epic to me. Now I want to fast forward just for a second. Then I'll get to questions because the priest wasn't very much. The priest was the crux of his testimony was that he was denied the ability to pray um, and was told by hospital staff. And the question that was presented to the jury was that uh, uh, the argument the defense tried to make, I'm going to pull this down. When we get to the priest, the argument defense tries to make is that the person who uh, the person who um, told him he couldn't pray, that might have been DCF. And the plaintiff's counsel gets up and says, was DCF walking around wearing a lab coat? And I was like, oh, shit, throwing fire. And then the judge chimes in and says, well, Dr. Sally Smith was too. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. This is getting this trial is in the early stages, in the early stages. There's a lot of information that's still yet to come out. I have been not impressed with plaintiff's case. Today, the afternoon session might have changed my mind a bit. I'm still watching. I'm still very curious. I still think that Maya and her team has a very, 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 very tall mountain to climb. They've got a really tall mountain to climb because there is a lot of muddied water here. But before I get too far, let's listen because the jury had questions for this doctor too. Do you, or was there, or do you know if there was? Hang on. But I don't. Um, I do both as part of my evaluation. So, um, it, you know, they nope. did in this Hang case, on. like, list of teachers, but it's not uncommon for people not to list. They usually were on from a. Just me, I'm tired. Just getting about at least an hour a week before was providing. So, Jury asked like four questions. Hang on. Oh my gosh. Um, I didn't evaluate it early on, but I would have anticipated they would have started with at oh, least a yep. power oh, shit. We need this one. We need this one. We need this one. Um, person that was seeing her was providing. So, um, sorry. No, we need this. We need this. We need this question. Okay, uh, members of the jury, I'm going to go ahead and ask all the Here questions. Just as just as a reminder, if when we're having this, if you want to stand up and stretch, you are more than welcome. In Ready fact, you're always Here's welcome to stand and stretch, even if we're having questions. Anything that you want to do, that's fine. Okay, I, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Transcript will say that there were absolutely no no laughs with that one. <laughs> Love this judge, okay, um, Dr. Duncan. Uh, how many hours is appropriate for psych treatment without resolving the medical diagnosis? I, I, you know, I evaluated my, but it was at the latter end. So um, I didn't evaluate it early on, but I would have anticipated they would have started with at least an hour minimum of therapy because that's what our prior um, person that was seeing her was providing. So um, I would have think that assessment and they could determine if they need to increase or decrease their frequency. But I was just shocked with the stress it dropped, you know, even um, overall, because she was getting about at least an hour a week before it was my understanding. Okay, the next question from the jury. In the absence of medical diagnosis, in the light of the patient treatment, would you, or of the PT, physical um, 
therapy treatment, would you still use the word warehouse in reference to all children? Can, can you read that one more? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I, I misread no, it. You didn't. This question is really important. Please listen. You do a good job. I just may have tired. <laughs> in the absence of medical diagnosis, in the light of the physical therapy treatment, would you still use the word warehouse in reference to all children's hospital? I, I, I use that term because I did not think they were following up on the neurological hospital so to figure out what was going on medically with her. And also they were not providing, they were, there was a lot of suggestion that it was just strictly psychological in nature. Um, and so I would have anticipated getting more than three hours of therapy at past the initial assessment. Um, as far as PT, I'm not a medical doctor, but in my experience, people that get PT, I've worked in inpatient rehab, they usually have a medical diagnosis to get that. So. The next question from the jury, uh, can collateral interviews be performed with individuals that you deem necessary or only with individuals that are provided by your client? Um, I do both as part of my evaluation. So there you go. Um, it, they you want know, to know she's biased. In this case, like list of teachers, but it's not uncommon for people not to list people. And so in my work, just not in this case, I often ask to speak to individuals that may be not listed that I know are relevant. Um, obviously, the people can choose to participate or not. The collateral can, but um, in this case, I believe that all of the collaterals, um, the majority of them, the family did provide me as far as like the professionals and so forth. But I don't recall anybody like specifically say, can you call Dr. Katzenstein? You know, and I, I make the effort to call her. The next question, do you, or was there, or do you know if there was an option to apply for temporary privileges at Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital that would fast track an approval to allow you to evaluate Maya at uh, the hospital, all children, Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital. My understanding was there wasn't, they just kind of have like a meeting and it's usually two or three months because I know that um, I had some discussions and it was probably like in December, it was part of me evaluating her. Um, and so it, there wasn't anything that I was told about. And I couldn't find anything online about it. So I inquired, I think it was actually Catherine Beatty that maybe initially that I asked about and she directed me to somebody. Okay. Plaintiffs, any further follow-up questions? Great questions, by the way. No, you're Jurors, any further follow-up questions? May this, uh, may Dr. Duncan be excused? Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. I usually don't like jury questions. Those were good ones, though. They were good questions. Uh, and I thought they were important. So I'm going to catch up on Super Chats, get you guys out of here. We're going to do recap tomorrow, if I can, on what takes place tomorrow during the hearing. Um, but let's go ahead and get caught up. So, Courtney, thank you for the members chat. Made it to a non-Friday night live. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Mary Coppola, don't care what your religion is. However, everyone needs hope and faith during times in your life. I'm inclined to agree. Mary Coppola, again, it's also ironic that outside of Hopkins in the main campus in Baltimore is a huge statue of Jesus where you enter. I, I think it was... I'm not building religion into it. It's not religious prejudice or anything like that it's that they overplayed the influence part i'm not sure we'll see how it plays out i want to hear the hospital side as well idaho mom the hospital claims they thought that Maya was being manipulated and controlled by her mom through religion that's true they did think that but does that then allow you to deny that child rights that they have it's a question Ange Torres, I don't envy you at all for having to explain religious parts of the case. You did well. Thank you, Ange. It's not easy, but I try to be respectful all around. Melissa, you're doing great. Thanks for the recap. Thank you, Melissa. Fat Yoga, thank you. Rob, thanks for covering this case. It's so sad. It is very sad. It's complicated. It's complicated. But even in complicated cases, we can see some interesting trial discussions, to be honest. And there's a lot. There's a lot here. There's a lot here to chat about. So, I mean... I, We'll see. I do have to thank people for gifting memberships tonight. Layla uh, Quinones, thank you for the five memberships. And XCDA, thank you for the five memberships. Thank you guys for uh, following along and watching. This was a longer recap stream than I wanted to do. I wanted to try and give it to an hour, but there was a lot that happened in the afternoon session. I'm glad that we got to cover it. Um, I want to thank the, the mods on Discord and YouTube for help keeping the chat dialogue on topic. Y'all pulled extra weight tonight. I picked a tough topic and I, I thank all sets of mods for doing this. You guys do some amazing work and, and chat. I, I thank you guys for your engagement and for doing so respectfully. Like I said, this is a tough case and I very much respect that people have opinions. Um, please comment on the stream. If you want to see me do more coverage, what I will say is that if you do comment on the stream, please do so with the same level of respect you do in the chat. It, it means the world to me that you guys engage with the channel. Um, 
especially on a topic that's something that's close to home in the way that I handle law, in the way that I practice law. So please, please do so respectfully. Please like the stream on your way out. And um, I'm going to be redirecting you guys over to Ian because he's my buddy. And he's covering some, uh, well, some some fun, lighthearted topics. So thank you guys for being here. Very much appreciate it. I hope you guys have a wonderful evening and I will see you soon. Until next time.